This meeting is being held in compliance with the Open Public Meeting Act, Chapter 231, Public Law 1975. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in the following manner. The annual notice was forwarded to the Asbury Park Press and posted on the Municipal Bulletin Board. All notices are on file with the Planning Board Secretary. Fire exits are located on the east and west sides of the Council Chambers as well as the rear of the building. I would ask anyone with a cell phone or any other device to kindly put it in silent mode for the duration of the meeting. As a reminder, this meeting is also being recorded by APTV. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here. Mayor Delmore. Here. Here. Michael Manzella. Here. Trudy Saitas. Jennifer Souter. Here. Alexis Taylor. Here. Rick Lambert. Here. Barbara Kutcher. Here. Um, there are a couple of things I'd just like to go over before we get started. Uh, I did this last time, and I'd like to do it again if for those that maybe were not here. During this, this just to give you some idea of process. What's going to happen is that there's, um, there's going to be some presentations by the professionals for this application. Uh, the public will get a chance to ask questions after all that is finished. Um, after all the presentations are finished, you have an opportunity to ask a question of, about the topic that was presented and only about the topic that was presented. If you have a chance to go to the microphone one time, if, if your questions are repetitive, I will state so in the interest of moving things forward. But everyone will have a chance to speak and ask questions if they, if they would like. Um, after all the present presentations are finished, then this is, I'm assuming, not going to be tonight, uh, there will be a time when there is public comment that will be allowed that you can state your feelings about the, the project itself. That is not, that most likely will not be tonight, Maybe it will be. Um, I'm, 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 I'm not hopeful. But anyway, so the, pub, the public comment time, that's once again, that, that's, a, uh, that's a three minute limit on public comment. And we, we ask throughout this whole process to please be mindful and not be repetitive in your questions and comments. We, we, everything is being recorded. It's in the transcripts. So please, I'm, I, I'm, I will have to stop people that are repeating the same questions. Um, the other thing that uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Um, the other question I have is that uh, from our fire official: Is anybody outside waiting to get in? That there is no room. No. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask for a motion uh, for a. Uh, to allow for a three-minute comment on this application um, with, the, uh, with the discretion of the planning board if they would like to extend that three minutes. Second. Explain that to me. What that means is that, what that, means is that if we get to the, to the comment section, that the public will have three minutes to state their comment. Three minutes to state a comment. Yes. No limit to cross examine. Correct. Okay. Okay. Hi. Hi. Okay. All right. Um, the next item. Sorry. Just so that we understand the way, just a little more clarification sure. on the procedure. This this is a contested matter. Okay. So the way this will work is the applicant will conclude their case. Um, objectives counsel will cross-examine witnesses, other people are cross-examining witnesses. Once that case is, once the applicant has included their case, I, based on emails I've seen, the objectors counsel has every intention of calling witnesses. So then it will proceed to, which is no different than a trial. Okay. So you'll have, applicant goes first, objectors will go second, and then if there's, after all that's said and done, if there's no need to recall any witnesses from either side, then the board will typically deliberate and vote on the matter. And as the chairwoman has said, it's extremely unlikely that's all going to take place tonight. Uh, I, I don't envision that taking place at all. So, that's the way, it, that's the procedure. OK, 
Okay, and now uh, if we go to the the agenda, uh, the approval of the minutes for May 29th. Motion okay. to approve those minutes. Second. Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, if we can move forward, uh, then uh, we have Asbury Partners to come up. Thank you. And start the process. For the record, my name is Jennifer Phillips Smith. I'm an attorney with Gibbons PC, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Asbury Partners to continue the hearing concerning the Beach Club located at Block 4502, Lot 1.23. I have a few housekeeping items before we bring up our first, or I guess our second witness, but our first this evening. Uh, first, in response to comments that we heard at the first meeting and after meeting with the board's professionals, we did submit revised plans on June 14th. Uh, those plans were submitted to the, the planning board secretary. Uh, we also sent an electronic version to council for uh, safe Asbury waterfront. Mm -hmm. We've received several letters since our last meeting. Uh, we have a letter that we received on June 18th from Mr. Lieberman concerning parking. We do intend to address this letter. Uh, we do not believe that the statement of law contained in this letter is correct. We believe that the redevelopment plan explicitly does not require parking for commercial uses. But I will tell you that the witness we're calling this evening is not going to be the one addressing it. It will be Keenan Hughes, who is our professional planner. And he's going to be our fourth witness. I don't think we're going to reach him tonight. So if we don't, I don't want anyone to think that we don't plan on addressing the, the comments concerning parking. It's just that the witness that's called first this evening isn't going to address them. Uh, we also received a letter addressed to me and to the DEP from Mr. Lieberman, also dated June 18th, concerning the CAFR permit. I will tell you that we have, Asbury Partners, has been in contact with the DEP concerning the validity and the ongoing nature of the CAFR permit for many years now. And during that time, we have been in constant construction, which fully conforms to the regulations, and thus the permit has not expired. The last time the DEP confirmed this for us was just in November of this past year. Uh, out of an abundance of caution though, back on June 7th, actually before receiving this letter, we did submit compliance plans to the DEP so that they can weigh in and confirm that the, the CAFR permit is valid and ongoing and that these plans in fact fully comply with the CAFR permit. Yes, let's mark Should we mark them? Yeah, sure. you want those letters? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I think I do we have any series for objectors uh, exhibits? Yes, we're up to three. We're up to three, or, or the next one will be four, or three. I think this one will be three. Okay, so just make each one in date sequence: 03, 04, 05, etc. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. First one's O2. So we will mark the letter that concerns parking that was addressed to me, uh, dated June 18th, 2019, as O2. And the letter that was addressed to me and to Christopher Jones of the NJDEP, also dated June 18th, we'll mark that O3. Uh, finally, uh, just to confirm, we did give adequate public notice of this application prior to the last hearing, and we did carry it forward to this meeting. And also looking around the room, I note that there are many extra seats that are still available, and as the chairperson confirmed, there's no one that's been held outside due to fire code issues. With that, I'd like to call up our first witness this evening, Sean Delaney, who is our civil engineer. One other uh, housekeeping item. Rick Lambert is here in attendance this evening. Okay. Uh, he has listened to either the tapes or CD and examined the exhibits, which is set forth in the certification. Is that correct? Yes. For them from the last meeting. Uh, he signed the certification. I'd like that entered into as whatever B number we're up to. And I've supplied a, a copy of that to uh, both Mr. Lieberman and uh, Ms. Okay, that's fine. So, 
he is eligible to participate and vote at some point. Thank you. I think we just need to have Mr. Dillon. Yes. Do you swear or affirm the testimony given during this proceeding to be the truth, of all truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. So can you for the record? Uh, Sean, S E A N, Delaney, D E L A N Y. I'm a principal with Bowman Consulting, located at 303 West Main Street in Freehold, New Jersey. I'm a licensed civil engineer, a professional engineer in the state of New Jersey since 2003 with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from NGIT, graduated in 1999, have over 20 years of experience um, in civil engineering site development, um, I've testified before several planning and zoning boards throughout the state of New Jersey. We would like to offer Mr. Delaney as an expert in the field of civil engineering. Okay. Thank you. Um, Sir, um, my name is Stuart Lieberman, and I represent the objectors. Um, I'm just curious, um, when's the last time you submitted a stormwater management plan to the Rural Planning Board or Zoning Board? Uh, it's been within the last 30 days. Okay. Do you do that as a regular routine part of, of, of your work for your clients? If it is required, yes. Okay. And you seal the drawings as part of your practice? If it's under my guide, if I'm overseeing the project or designing it, yes. Very good. I have no questions, no further questions. Thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Delaney, to begin, can you reorient the board to the location <coughs> of the property and discuss the bulk standards that apply to the proposed development? And, and also just which, which when we're looking at these, can we just verify which dates we're looking at? I think what, what I'm going to do just to make the record clear is I'll remark all of them. Okay. So that, that way we're not confused about revision dates. That's fine. And I do have, as we did last time, an exact paper copy that we have printed out. So we'll begin by marking this first exhibit on the screen as A17, picked up from <coughs> last time. Mr. Delaney, if you could, as you begin, tell us what A17 is. A17 is a uh, copy of the boundary and topographic survey for the subject property that was submitted as part of the original application. It is, it is dated uh, 32918, okay. prepared by my office. Okay, Mr. Delaney, then can you discuss the location of the property and the bulk standards that apply to it? Certainly. Uh, looking at the survey, um, the property is identified as block 4502, lot 1.23. It's the left half of the image on site located along Ocean Avenue as the western boundary, the boardwalk is the eastern boundary, and then the uh, extensions of 6th Ave and is located to the south and 7th Ave to the north of the property. The site is t a little over 25,000 square feet, 25,396 to be exact, with a lot frontage of 248 uh, feet um, along Ocean Avenue. Um, it is vacant right now, being undeveloped. Um, and there are uh, three easements that are present along the property boundaries. Along the Ocean Ave frontage, there's a 20-foot wide <clears throat> pedestrian and utility easement. And then there are two 15-foot wide utility and access easements, one each on the north and south sides of the property. Yep. So looking at the next exhibit. Which will mark is A18. This is uh, this exhibit is titled Exhibit Existing Conditions, uh, dated today, 6-24-19, prepared uh, by my office. Um, this is uh, using the, the survey as a background, just colors and identifies some of the lot constraints on the property. The blue line um, around the perimeter, that is the site property line, the boundary for lot 1.23. The uh, yellow area across Ocean Avenue that is the 20 foot wide easement um, in that, along that location. The two uh, hatched areas, striped areas on the north and south sides are the 15 foot wide um, pedestrian and utility easements um, in those locations. And the green area is the remainder of the lot which is available for development um, on the property. Essentially, the easements to the uh, north, south, and west are acting as the the setback lines to any building and construction on the property, and the boardwalk on the east side is acting as that that, that setback 
at that point. And Mr. Delaney, does the lot size conform to the requirements of the waterfront redevelopment area? Yes, it does. And does the lot frontage conform to the requirements in the waterfront redevelopment plan area? Yes, it is. Uh, just for clarification, 15,000 square foot minimum is required. We're at over 25,000 square feet and 100 foot lot width is required where we're a little over 248. Are there any other bulk standards within the waterfront redevelopment plan? There are not. beginning a 17 yep. um, one of the things to talk about too is uh, elevations and, and slopes on the grade as well as uh, existing utilities um, the site right now on the eastern edge along the boardwalk is up at elevation a little over 14 slopes down to the existing sidewalk on the west side at about elevation 11 um, and then all utilities uh, for the site are, are, are located either in Ocean Avenue or within that 20-foot easement along the, uh, the Ocean Ave frontage. All right. If we're going to move on to this next exhibit, I'll mark it as A19. Can you tell us what it is? A19 is a uh, copy of the layout and dimensioning plan. Uh, that was part of the revised submission dated 6-13-2019, uh, prepared by my office. It's sheet five of 14 of the site plan set. So as I mentioned, I'm going to go back to the setbacks again. Um, so, with, so the setbacks to the north and south, the easements are 15 feet wide. Um, therefore, the, the minimum setback to the, any building or, or construction on the site would be 15 feet. Um, we are proposing a uh, 15 foot to the, the farthest point of um, construction to the north and south. The building, as Mr. Handel pointed out uh, during his testimony, um, steps back a little bit on the uh, near the western edge of the property, and they are that located about 16.7, 16.8 feet to the to the property line. So a little extra buffer off of those property lines. In addition, along the western 20 foot easement. Uh, we have had to hold a minimum of 20 feet. We are providing 20 and a half feet along that location. And then there is no setback along the boardwalk, and we are providing as basically all improvements up to the edge of the boardwalk um, as proposed. And to clarify, is it the easements that are requiring the setback or the waterfront redevelopment plan? It is the easements that are, that are dictating the setbacks of, this, of the building and the development. Could the applicant under the waterfront redevelopment plan, absent the easements, build up to the property line. Yes. So um, I know there's a, there was a question last time as well um, regarding the setbacks and the relationship of this to the um, other uses up and down the boardwalk. Um, the 20 foot easement that runs along Ocean Avenue runs along the entire length of Ocean Avenue all the way down to the south. Therefore, every building along Ocean Avenue that fronts the boardwalk or between the boardwalk and Ocean Avenue has to meet that 20 foot setback. Uh, along that, that side. In addition, all those buildings are also located uh, up on the boardwalk for direct access from those facilities, retail establishments, restaurants, and, and the like up there for direct access to and from the boardwalk for patrons. So there's a zero setback on that side. We are consistent with what all the other pavilions are doing up and down um, Ocean Avenue. Um, in addition, the, the other uh, pavilions also have um, access from Ocean Avenue within the 20-foot uh, um, easement, consisting of stairways, ramps, um, also utilities located in that in those areas. We as well are also proposing similar um, improvements within the easement for access to the building, and that is, is dictated by the elevation of the boardwalk for access on that side. And when you talk about the front access area and the 20-foot setback there. Am I correct that over the last few days that the applicant actually has revised the layout of the sidewalk structure within that area? That is correct. Uh, Mr. Handel had testified previously that we had a, an access stairway, looking at Exhibit A-19, um, on the southern end of the building, uh, providing stairs up to a landing area for access into the main front door. There was also a sloped walkway that led from that landing area to the north down to the existing sidewalk, um, about a little more than midpoint of the building um, heading north. 
The previous plan showed a separation between the bike area, the bike parking on with on our site, and the uh, walkway, um, uh, the slope walkway access to the building. Based on comments and some and a meeting with the um, the board's planner, um, we have revised the layout there to um, combine or, or better connect the uh, the bike rack area. <coughs> And that entrance so people don't have to exit out onto the sidewalk to get into the landing area um then into the entrance to that the slope sidewalk up to our to the main entrance of the building um once again the purpose of, of bringing the the walkway down to that location um provide ad accessible route to the front entrance of the building and the location of the existing parking stalls that are located uh, on front of our property are located at the northern end of our site um, so we felt it best to bring that sidewalk as close to that, that location for those, those folks parking there to be able to get out of their cars and, and get up as quickly into this slope walkway to get into the facility. And the two easements located on either side of the building, what is the purpose of those easements? The purpose of that is for public access um, from Ocean Avenue up to the boardwalk and to the beach. And um, as a requirement, I believe in the waterfront redevelopment plan, those access points are, are to be maintained, uninterrupted, cannot be built upon um, for the public use. So it cannot be developed for private use, gated, closed off, or improved upon with buildings or other improvements. The existing, sorry, the southern uh, pedestrian uh, access point is a, an existing 15 foot wide uh, concrete walkway um, at the end of the pedestrian crossing from 6th Avenue up to the boardwalk. We are proposing to remain, that is proposing, proposed to remain in its current condition, um, or in its current state and maintained as an access point. Um, the north side is a new um, access, access way, 15 feet in width also, um, to be provided from the existing sidewalk up to the uh, proposed boardwalk upon, upon completion for access along the 7th Ave um, continuation. Um, so both sides will have public access that will be uninterrupted um, and it will not be, uh, this, this development will not hinder that access in, in any way. And how about the people who are inside the beach club? How would they access the beach? As Mr. Handel pointed out, there are three um, access points into the building, into and out of the building, the main entrance on Ocean Avenue. And then there are two doors that lead out to the public access uh, walkways on the north and south sides of the building um, so anyone inside the facility would exit out one of those three doors either out to the sidewalk on Ocean Avenue or to one of the 15 foot wide pedestrian access ways and then turn head up to the boardwalk there is no direct access from our facility from this facility to the uh, proposed boardwalk How would emergency vehicles access the property? Um, they would access, uh, emergency personnel would access it similar way as any patron um, of the uh, facility that enter one of the three um, doors locating it. Vehicles would um, pull up, utilize the existing striped area um, at the end of 6th Avenue. Um, they could probably pull up onto the uh, pedestrian walkway areas as well if need be. I'm, I'm, assume assumptions that if for any emergencies that would happen on the beach and the boardwalk those ambulances uh, police cars would utilize those walkways um, to be able to get up as close to the boardwalk as possible into the beach to get people on and off similar situation could happen for anybody uh, that needed assistance for this facility we have designed the uh, the northern access point as a reinforced concrete walk that would be able to support um, you know an occasional vehicle as needed six inch thick with some reinforcing in there um, so we have it uh, we've prepared for use uh, for emergency vehicles if needed can you please discuss the impervious coverage on the site certainly um, one of the comments from the from the board engineer uh, related to the level of development intensity on the site and it ties back to the um, Waterfront redevelopment plan uh, on page 90, which then references also the CAFR regulations and the CAFR permit that was uh, approved for the overall waterfront development. Um, in that area, 
Um, it classifies this the waterfront redevelopment area as a special urban area um, and subject to high intensity development. It's, it's quoted right out of the, the, it's taken word for word out of the uh, waterfront redevelopment plan. Um, in the requirements for that is that a maximum purpose coverage of 90% is permitted. A maximum urban shrub cover of 5% yeah, minimum, sorry, is permitted, and a minimum tree planting requirement of 5% is also uh, required or permitted. Um, in this case, the, the, these th three criteria um, were based upon the overall waterfront redevelopment area, not each individual site specific uh, development. Um, as a whole, the entire waterfront has to comply with these 90, 90%, 5%, and 5% requirements. In this case, some, some properties maybe have a little more impervious services, maybe up to 95, but you have parks and open space areas scattered throughout the development, which add substantial uh, non-impervious tree planting and shrub planting areas to help uh, com comply with these regulations as a whole. For this site, um, we, we did calculate the, the values um, just for comparison purposes. Um, the site we got the, the application that we submitted, we calculated the impervious coverage on the property is 76%. And that consisted of the, the proposed building, the public access walks on the north and south side uh, of the property, um, as well as we included the pool deck area. Um, and we did that to be conservative. Um, the pool deck area, based on the plans that were submitted, is going to have openings in it, um, which will allow any runoff that does land on it to. Info, or travel through the deck into the underlying soils, essentially recharge. It acts almost as a, a non-impervious surface by, by allowing the water to get into the soils beneath. Um, if we remove the pool deck from our calculations, the, act, the site impervious coverage of buildings, concrete walks, and the like is only 29% on the site. Um, the herb and shrub cover, um, Mr. Bauer will talk more about where the, where the, the plantings are located, is approximately 10% um, of the site, um, and you'll see it when, uh, during his testimony. Um, the pros tree planting uh, areas, right now we have 0% on site. Like I said, we're not required to provide all 5% on our property because it's a uh, overall development requirement, not a site specific uh, each lot specific requirement on the property. So that the fact that we have 0% here does not mean that the, the, rest, of this, the rest of the development is um, not compliant with this, this regulation. In fact, it is in compliance based on the approval that CAFRA had granted um, originally. So before we get into stormwater a little further, perhaps you can discuss the grading at the site. Going to the, the next uh, slide. Okay, so this is the one that was page six of your submission, and I guess we will mark A20. Okay. Yes, this is the, uh, the grading and utility plan um, that was revised on 6-13-2019, sheet six of 14 in the revised plans that were submitted. Excuse me. As I mentioned before, the grades, existing grades on site are a little up of 14 up at the boardwalk, 14, 14 and a half, and slope down to approximately elevation 11 at the existing sidewalk on Ocean Avenue. Um, we are proposing to maintain uh, those grades on north and south sides. The northern, sorry, the eastern end of our site is brought up to elevation 14.5 to be equal with the boardwalk elevations in that location. Um, and on the eastern, sorry, the western edge, the at grade features where the bike rack is, the start of the um, sloped walkway and the bottom of the stairs for the main entrance are all down at grade level. We are sloping up the grade um, and soil from those sidewalks up to the building facade uh, for landscaping to accommodate the stairs and the slope slope ramp up there. So it looks like a sorry a um, a smooth transition. Um, That's why you're not seeing any anything underneath the building um, or any uh, other extensions of the walls down further. The grade will stop at the, the face of the building essentially on the. Uh, western side of the property um, and the reason for 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 that um, primarily is is due to the FEMA flood elevations on the property um, the effective map that's the, the effective FEMA flood zone on the property is elevation 10 we're in a VE 10 zone um, 
normally that would mean that the any improvements to there for in a V zone would have to have the lowest horizontal member one foot the bottom of that member one foot above the flood zone so the bottom of our horizontal member would be at, would be at 11 and then the rest of our building would continue upward however the FEMA also uh, several years ago issued preliminary maps after Sandy that revised the flood elevations those maps changed these the flood zone on site from a VE 10 zone to a VE 12 zone essentially raising the flood elevation two feet on, a, on the property um, therefore in our design uh, the, the DP the DP requires it to use the more restrictive elevation um, for these designs and, and to make sure you're compliant uh, with FEMA flood hazard building codes and the uh, flood hazard area regulations of the NJDEP. So we have designed the site to meet the uh, 12 elevation 12 requirement. Our lowest horizontal member, I believe Mr. Handel also testified to this, will be at elevation 13. From there, it'll extend up to a finished floor of the beat of the club and the, and the facility inside the buildings and the deck areas will be at elevation 14.5, essentially two and a half feet above that flood elevation. Can you describe how the utilities will service the site? Certainly, as I mentioned, ocean, the utilities are all located either within Ocean Avenue or along the within the 20 foot easement um, uh, in front of the property. Um, sanitary is proposed to connect to a, an existing uh, lateral that's low, that's present on the northern end within that easement, extending lateral up to the southern end of our property and into the into the site. Um, Water is existing within Ocean Ave. Uh, we'll, we'll connect into that with a um, a single uh, water main coming across the street into a, um, a vault that will be located below grade for two for a fire and, and a domestic service that will be fed into the inside of the facility. Electric services are also located within the easement. We are proposing a transformer at the northwest corner of the site within the easement that will then feed into um, internal rooms inside uh, for, for metering. Um, gas also located within uh, Ocean Avenue, um, trying to maintain that trench as close to the water main so we don't have too many tr individual trenches along Ocean Avenue. And as Mr. Handel pointed out previously, the gas meter will be located on the southern building facade in that little niche um, between the building and the uh, walkway. Um, we've carved it out and it'll be recessed back there and Mr. Bauer will talk more about some screening um, for that. I think Mr. Handel pointed that out as well with the living wall uh, that's going to be located in that, loca in, in that area. Um, storm sewer, we are proposing uh, two roof drains on northern and southern portions of the building. Those roof drains will, dist will collect the uh, covered portions of the building, uh, discharge them into a 24-inch uh, perforated pipe and stone trench that runs parallel to the building north and south. The purpose of that is to um, capture some of these smaller storms and, and infiltrate it into the, into the underlying soils. It was a rec recommendation by the TRC committee when we first presented this application um, to see if we could do something to try and put some more water into the, into the underlying soils instead of having it all run off into the um, existing storm sewers in Ocean Avenue. Um, the roof drains are six inches and eight inches, um, six inches on the north end, eight inches on the south end. Um, and I'll talk more about the, the actual storm system in a, in a few minutes. Um, and in addition, we also will be providing a irrigation system on site in the landscaped areas that the landscape the irrigation system will also be uh, equipped with a rain sensor. Um, so it will limit and, and hopefully avoid turning on in the, any rain events or where this, the moisture in the soil is high enough that it would, be, would not uh, need any watering to occur. You mentioned stormwater. Can you discuss which regulations you reviewed in connection with designing this stormwater management system for this project? Certainly. The overall development um, created a uh, a master plan, essentially stormwater system throughout the waterfront redevelopment area. Series of inlets, uh, uh, storm conveyance pipes, water quality structures throughout the road network, um, both north and south and east and west. Um, that application was, was, was obviously pre-approved as part of the original uh, pr overall approval for the, for the waterfront redevelopment area. And as each product has come in, 
to develop on each one of the individual sites, they're tying into the existing system and confirming that the systems, that the, what they're proposing is sufficient and can be handled by the uh, works with what was originally approved. Um, under these regulations, uh, under the current regulations, um, there are some criteria that are, that are classified based upon the New Jersey Stormwater Management Regulations um, located at NJAC 7 colon 8. Um, and these, are, these would apply if the if a uh, product is, is defined as a major development. Major development is any product that increases impervious surface on site a quarter of an acre or disturbs more than one acre of land. Um, as I mentioned before, in our conservative nature, we were talking about an impervious coverage of about 76% on site, which equated to about uh, 0.44 acres, which would exceed that 0.25 or quarter acre limit. If we did not account for the pool deck, we could, uh, the, the impervious coverage would be down at 29%. We'd be under that quarter acre, and therefore the, the SOMA rules technically wouldn't apply as an individual basis on this site. Um, we still analyze the site using the stormwater regulations, we believe, because it's tied into the overall development. It felt it's, it's the correct thing to do. Um, with a major development, three criteria are required to be addressed, stormwater quantity, groundwater recharge, and stormwater quality um, for each development. In terms of the quantity, um, the regulations state that if the area discharges to a tidal water body, <coughs> then compliance with the quantity reductions is not required. Being the ultimate discharge for, for this area of the waterfront is the Atlantic Ocean, which is the tidal water body. Therefore, quantity reductions are not required for this product or for the, the waterfront development area. In addition, groundwater recharge. If you're in a planning area one, the recharging groundwater is not a requirement. Um, so once again, we are not required to, re based on this development, we are not required to recharge groundwater. However, based on the design, we are recharging some groundwater um, as a recommendation from the TRC committee. Water quality um, would be required based upon a quarter acre uh, or more of new impervious surfaces being uh, proposed on the property. Um, the interesting part here is the when you're treating water quality, you're trying to treat the sediments, oils um, from running off into the into into the existing storm sewer systems, from getting into lake streams and, and water bodies. Usually, those are related to vehicular use areas, roads, uh, parking lots, etc. Building roofs, uh, pedestrian walkways, where uh, walk where vehicular use is not uh, is not allowed or not performed are usually considered clean runoff areas and therefore are not really are not required to be treated um, by the regulations. Um, it should be noted that the overall redevelopment plan um, as part of the storm sewer system design has several water quality structures that have been in, uh, constructed throughout the road network, which handles the road runoff from the individual properties as well as the roadway road network in the waterfront area. Um, so any water that would drain off our site, for instance, the, the concrete areas, the walkways on the north and south, they're not captured by anything on our site or recharge. They flow from the boardwalk down to the street, are captured by two in, the two inlets in the street, and they're conveyed through the existing uh, city system of pipes, uh, road network, to water quality structures that are located uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the street network for treatment prior for discharging off site. That was all taken part of as part of the original CAFR permit and waterfront development plans that were prepared. Um, therefore, um, based on my, my review and my understanding of the regulations, the, my opinion that because the roof runoff is clean, the, there is no essentially dirty water coming from the site, and any areas that would be conveyed from the walkways that could potentially be or that are treated by the, the existing systems in the road network water quality standards have been met for this specific, this development as it relate to the entire uh, waterfront uh, project. Um, getting into the, uh, the system, the design uh, of the storm sewer system as we propose it, uh, it's a very simple system. The roof drains would discharge into a single 24 inch perforated pipe. That pipe would be surrounded by stone. Um, so the water that would come into it, in, that pipe is at elevation six with the bottom invert, two foot high. Um, water would fill up in the pipe, 
infiltrates the smaller storms would infiltrate up to the to the, the two year storm uh, water quality in two year storms would infiltrate into the underlying soils and then any larger storms the ten up through the hundred or even further if, if they if it ever happens um, would then discharge through two uh, overflow pipes that are at each end and connect to the existing inlets that are located on the north and south sides of the property along Ocean Avenue. Um, so we're not proposing to handle all of the drainage or all recharge the entire <coughs> roof runoff. Um, and it is that, it's just the runoff from the, the roof of the building, I believe Mr. Handel that is around 6,000 square feet um, for that area. And that would be put into this underground system infiltrate into the ground for the smaller storms and then larger storms discharged uh, into the existing system for ultimate discharge off site. As part of designing the stormwater system, were there any test borings done to determine the type of soils? There were some preliminary test, test uh, soil borings that were performed um, on the property, uh, three in particular that went along the frontage of the property along Ocean Avenue um, that we did examine uh, as part of the design. Um, they, they, the one thing when we're doing it, when you're doing at an infiltration system, you're looking at depth of seasonal high water, depth of water tables to make sure that there's sufficient room for the water to infiltrate into the groundwater, uh, the soils below and not back up and then cause backups further into the facility or, or elsewhere on, um, in the surrounding area. The results of those borings that we, that we looked at, um, they were borings, they were not test pits. Um, when they opened them up and analyzed it based upon um, criteria that these, the geotechnical engineer looked at, they estimated that the water table at that time was <coughs> approximately 10 feet below grade, um, which puts it down elevation elevation one up to elevation four um, through the property. Um, so based on that and putting our, our system, you know, the bottom of our system at six with our pipe, five and a half with a stone bedding underneath it, uh, we felt there was uh, the, our pipe being on the, the western end of the site where the, the elevation, water elevation would be around elevation one or two, there is sufficient uh, separation uh, between the, season, the water table and the bottom of our infiltration system uh, that meets the requirements of the uh, stormwater management rule. Two quick questions, if I could. I don't have to swear, right? No, <laughs> not if you ask the question. Is the 10 feet below grade, is that the seasonal high or is that observed at the time? It was done in a a test pit, so like a split spoon sample, and they analyzed it based on water content, so it was not a seasonal high. Okay, and when was that done? What month? It was performed back in April of 2018. Okay, thank you. Okay, <laughs> we just confirmed why we're at it. All elevations are in NAVD. 88. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So moving on from stormwater then. We had received questions about lighting. So I'm going to move to the next exhibit, which we'll mark as A21. So Mr. Delaney, can you describe generally how you propose to light the site? and just discuss some of the high points and low points of the lighting. Certainly. Um, so exhibit A21 first is the lighting plan for the ground floor, uh, sheet seven of 14, revised 613, 2019, as part of the resubmitted package. There will be some more exhibits that some, some things like uh, get a little, uh, hopefully I'll try to keep it simple and not as confusing and not confuse anybody. Um, this sheet seven of 14, what this exhibit also has added besides that plan is some color to it I d to for clarity on some of the light fixtures that are being proposed. This exhibit is, is specifically uh, deals with the pedestrian lights that are on the exterior of the building surrounding the pedestrian walkways on Ocean Avenue and the two 15 foot wide walkways from Ocean Avenue to the boardwalk. So, so the lighting analysis that was done um, took into account the four existing fixtures that are located along Ocean Avenue. Um, they're shown as the kind of purplish dots at the top of the screen. Those lights are approximately 12 feet in height. Their LED fixtures are about 38 watts each um, with a natural white color. Um, you'll understand 4,000 Kelvin. You'll understand this more as I get into more of what we're proposing. Um, in addition, there are two 
pole mounted lights along the walkways on the western side that are also in purple on the north and south sides. They are the existing existing lights and also light uh, I guess to be installed as part of the boardwalk project. They are, the fixtures are 18 feet high to the light source, 20 foot high poles to the top of the, the, the structure. They are the classic, um, I guess the classical type of uh, ornamental fixture, similar to what's on the boardwalk in some places, I believe. Um, those lights are, are also LEDs, 340 watts um, to illuminate those locations. They are also a natural white color at 4,000 Kelvin. And so the purple dot, just for my own clarification, those are what I would typically call, or what a common non-engineer would call street lights. Street lights, correct, mm -hmm. correct. And those are existing, so we, we included them in our analysis. Uh, I guess there was some comments from your board professionals to make sure that we included that um, in our light levels to, to make sure that we didn't need to either add more lights or, or determine what, what lighting was needed along those areas to provide sufficient illumination levels. Um, the green areas on the north and south site, those are wall-mounted uh, those are wall-mounted fixtures um, that we are proposing to add additional lighting along the walkway. There was the original uh, existing conditions, I believe, had a fixture on our on a light, another pole mounted light fixture um, on the site that is obviously due to the limits of our development were removed. So we supplementing with some wall mounted lights um, along the, the perimeter uh, of the of the facility of the bill of the, the development to illuminate the walkway specifically. Um, those lights are 10 watt LED lights mounted at seven foot heights. And the color of those, the street lights are at 4,000 Kelvin. The normal white, these are a warm white color, about 2,700 Kelvin. So they are a soft, more of a yellowish, um, softer glow, not as that bright LED fixture that you see sometimes in a parking lot for a um, retail facility uh, to really light it up and, and do it. We're trying to put ambient lighting on the outside, not make it uh, a shopping center uh, a lighted facility around the perimeter. In addition, um, the lights in red um, that are along the, the west facade and the south facade, those are wall graze, uh, grazing lights. Um, they are also LED fixtures, about five watts per linear foot. Um, they are angled up towards the building to illuminate the facade and the, and the, the green screen, essentially, that's, that's being uh, pr that's proposed. They are. They will have a shield on them. They are angled at about a nine degree nine degree tilt to allow um, all the light from that to hit the building and not go off into the sky or um, reflect or, or anybody affect anybody walking on the sidewalk adjacent to it. Um, they are a very warm white color at 2200 Kelvin, so even even a softer glow than the lights around the perimeter. The lights in blue are little tape lights, ribbon lights. Uh, some people, it's popular now at Christmas time to have those rope lights. It's essentially the same type of a, of a system. They are located underneath the stairs and adjacent to the uh, sloped walkway um, leading to the entrance. They are 2.9 watts per linear foot. Um, an LED also a very warm white at 2200 Kelvin. So very low, um, just accent lighting along those, those areas. And then there's one other fixture that's located over the main door. Uh, it's hard to see uh, on there. Um, right over the main steps, there's a a sconce light that is located over the over that main entrance. It's a single 27 watt LED fixture, mounted about eight and a half and eight and a half feet above the uh, of the landing area. Um, once again, about 2700 Kelvin, a warm white color in that area, just to illuminate the front entrance. Um, with regards to the lighting levels and what, what this all means, we did the analysis was run to determine using those lights of what the, the lighting levels would be along the walkways. So along Ocean Avenue, we have a max of 3.7 uh, 3 foot candles. The minimum, obviously due to some areas made up by the building or out in the street at zero, with an average of about one foot candle across the frontage of the property. Along the north walkway, we have a max of six foot candles minimum just a little above zero with an average of just under two foot candles um, and similarly on the south side uh, a max 7.9 about a half foot candle minimum 
with an average of about 2.7 foot candles. So the lighting levels provided are sufficient for um, providing the illumination necessary for pedestrian safety um, along Ocean Avenue and the two uh, walkways from the Ocean Avenue up to the boardwalk. Can I ask just one quick question? This is a question, so let's remember. <laughs> Did you analyze uniformity on these pedestrian? We did an analyze some uh, average min ratios and max min ratios um, for each of these areas. Um, for the Ocean Ave, um, because of the minimum being zero, kind of didn't really, uh, couldn't get a number um, for that location. On the north side, we have an av average minimum ratio of 18.7 and a max min ratio of 60. That's based on you know, maximum of six and a, a low point of point 0.1. Um, once again, as, it's, as it goes off of the site, it gets lower. Um, and then on the south side, you have an average min of 4.55 and a max min of 13.1. Next one. So, so Mark, this next exhibit is A22. Can you explain what we're looking at here, Mr. Delaney? Sure. And the next one, A23, that we're going to mark as well, which is the next slide. Um, these are the details of all the lighting fixtures that were that were included on the lighting plan. There is a back on the bottom of Exhibit A21. The lighting schedule for the ground floor has all of these fixtures that I'm talking about, um, both internal and external, listed through there. Um, what I've done here is, as, as I mentioned on the the Exhibit A21. These, these fixtures uh, identify which of these styles of fixtures um, are located based on the color coordination between the two, um, two between the plan view and the details. So um, lower right hand corner, the, the green box, the box around the light fixture surrounded by green, those are the wall mounted lights on the north and south side of the, uh, the walkway. The purple lights up top and then the box up in the upper left hand corner of the plan are the existing light fixtures. The one on the left is the Ocean Ave fixture, and the one on the right is the fixture for the walkways. Um, the red box is the um, gra uh, grazing lights along the front and south side of the building, west side. The tape light along the stairs and the sloped walkway is, is surrounded in the blue in the blue box. Um, and then going to the next one, which would be A23. Go back. that one. A23, um, which is the light fixture details, ground floor sheet 9 of 14 of the set. The lower right hand corner is a fixture that is located above the main entrance to the facility. A single, the single sconce light. There was one that you'd mentioned that was shielded. Was that the HT that is on the two walkways on this on either side or? The, the, one, the one is the, if you go back to the exhibit A22, I don't know if we can zoom in on the red box up top. Well, the oh, okay, the, re the red one, it. red one through the center. Yes. Those are the the grazing lights up the wall. So those um, are the ones that are shielded. Yeah. There's a picture, an image on the right hand side, which shows the angle. There's mm -hmm. a screen on on the on the detail, the mounting mechanism for it, to show that it, it does direct up towards the the building and not into the night sky. Okay. Um, the one over the, the one over the main door also has a extended shield onto it, so it's angled down towards the the ground and extend a shield off the top of it um, to further prevent any light from spilling out into the roadway or, or um, into the walkway so it illuminates the landing area only. Okay. Thank you. Should we go to the next exhibit that I'll mark A24? Sure. A24 is the um, once again, same sheet, sheet seven of 14, the lighting plan for the ground floor. The colors on this one are now uh, directed towards the interior of the facility um, only. So the, I guess one of the big things that came up at the last hearing were the poles on the, the eastern side along the boardwalk that are uh, illuminated in blue or colored in blue. Um, those are the free, four freestanding pole lights they were proposing to illuminate 
the the pool deck area essentially um, that's required. There's a uh, the pool code requires a certain lighting intensity or level at the an average level over the pool deck at the edge of the pool of 10 foot candles. Um, so through many iterations of trying to figure out what the best way to light this um, without having 400 light fixtures, smaller light fixtures throughout the development, um, a combination of some of these pole mounted lights as well as some wall mounted lights to illuminate the deck area were, were proposed to be, uh, we felt was the best, best option to illuminate the, uh, the area. Um, those poles, um, it was five poles previously on the previous plans. Um, over in the uh, northwest corner by the exit door, there's, there's a little hatched area or uh, clouded area um, there. There was a fifth pole that was located in that corner based upon the testimony that provided Mr. Handel last, uh, last time where the pool shrunk by a couple feet which increased the deck space by a little a couple feet. They had to rework some of the lighting uh, photometrics to account for that. So some of the light switched on the, the interior, the western, or western side of the interior. Um, they moved some things on the outside and were able to eliminate that one pole on that north side. The remaining poles, um, are each pole will have four to five small little light fixtures attached to them. Um, each of those lights is 36 watts LED. So each fixture will have the four lot, if with five fixtures on it, will have 180 watts total coming off that pole. If it's the four, there's one single pole with four lights, they'll have 144 watts um, coming off that. The pole heights are 20 feet high. The light fixtures are not 20 feet high. Light fixtures are staggered. Two of the lights will be at 19 feet. Two of the lights will be down at 17 and a half feet. And the one pole with the fifth light will have that, that fifth light down at 16 feet in height. The dash lines that come off each of those, uh, off the fixtures, are the angles, the directional angles horizontally that each one of those lights will be directed into the property. So you can see that we are directing all of that light directly into the site and not along the, the, the property boundary of the boardwalk. Um, the intent is to light our facility and not spill over and become a nuisance to the surrounding properties in the boardwalk. Um, all of these lights will be the warm white color at 2700 Kelvin. Once again, a nice soft glow, um, not the bright bluish type of light that we would attribute to a lot of LED fixtures. The angle, as mentioned on the plan, those show the horizontal angles uh, of the fixture alignments. The vertical angles, they will be angled down towards the deck. Um, I realized when I wrote the chart, I put in here as a 60 degree angle. Um, the 60 degree angle I calculated from the vertical coming up 60 degrees. <laughs> Took the pole height times the, the, the direction of the thing to find the to calculate the angle of what was done. So from the horizontal, it will be 30 degrees down from that location into our property. Um, so I wanna make sure that's clear and I'll make sure that's clarified on any plans moving forward. I have uh, a question about the, the lights on those poles. Yes. Uh, are you able to adjust the angles or do they come uh, preset at an angle when you mount them on the pole? When they will be mounted, they will be set at the appropriate angles and they are not proposed to be moved again after that. They will not be fixed in those positions. They do have the ability to move, but it's not the intent to Adjust, once they're set in the right locations to keep them in the same location. Is the light source uh, shielded for each of the LEDs? I, be, I, be, I believe that there is a, uh, the, the housing does extend a little bit beyond that, at least on the top, on the top part, so it does not extend out. Um, and it is directed down towards the deck. So you will not see it from above across the street. Um, you'll be looking down, the, the fixture will be, oh, wait a minute, you should, we should not be able to see the light fixture uh, from elevated areas across the street and you won't see it from walking on the boardwalk because they will be directed away from, uh, directed towards the interior of the facility and not along the, um, the boardwalk path. The other lights um, inside, the, inside the middle of the facility uh, which one? There are two uh, groups of three uh, wall-mounted lights located on the western bulkhead of the roof deck. The area in red, there are two circles in magenta on either end, one on the north side and one on the south side. 
Um, those are low wattage LED lights. They are uh, two groups of three, as I mentioned, mounted uh, about 12 feet high at a 45 degree angle with the same shielding um, coming down into the, the pool deck. They are there to illuminate the two ends, the northern and, northern and southern ends of the, the deck itself. Um, <coughs> they are 27 watt LED fixtures. Uh, once again, that warm white color, 2700 Kelvin. Um, the red areas along the western bulkhead and then along the, the eastern edge of the kitchen out to that access door to the southern walkway, those are wall mounted lights. Um, they're mounted about 10 and a half feet high, uh, 10 watt LED fixtures. Once again, and they're somewhat in a box directed downward to illuminate just that area directly in front of the cabanas um, and the walkway in that, in that location. Once again, the warm white color, 2700 Kelvin. There is a green, um, the green dot that's located just past the entrance um, into the site where the access to the bathrooms and the locker rooms are. That's a single wall sconce, eight and a half watt LED fixture, seven feet mounting height. Um, once again, most of these fixtures are all this warm white color, 2700 Kelvin. And then the yellow area that's behind the, the food and beverage spot um, on the southern, on the northern face of the southern leg of the building. Those are, once again, facade grazing lights. There is a green screen that goes up that portion of the, the wall as well. Um, they are uh, seven watt LED fixtures. They're ground mounted, angled up to illuminate that wall only. Um, they laminate, they'll hit the wall, they'll not go into the night sky uh, to do that as well. And they are, once again, the warm white color facility. And then there are some additional lights at the ground level that um, that are more accenting lights uh, proposed. Inside the pool, you have two, two types of lights. You have 14 watt LED fixtures on the northern half of the pool on that little sun shelf before the stairs. They are recessed into the side of the pool. And then you also have 24 watt LED fixtures in the deeper sections of the pool. Same thing, recessed in um, for those areas. At the, the food and beverage area on the southern end of the site, the southern end of the pool, there are ceiling mounted lights. They are seven watt LED fixtures that are directed downward directly over the, the service area itself. Um, they are mounted nine feet high. There is a roof over that facility because the building, uh, the, the deck above it covers it. So they are just there to illuminate the workspace behind, the, uh, behind that uh, the facility. They're not there to illuminate the deck or the surrounding for any kind of patrons or, or uh, pedestrian movements. There are under counter lights that are once again, those low LED tape lights that are along the stairs and the, the walkway out front to illuminate underneath the counters. And then they also have some string lights um, that are above on top of the canopy. Those are similar to you know, your small Christmas lights. Um, that'll be up there, eight and a half LED uh, lights, about 10 feet high um, in that location. Um, once again, we ran the, the statistics for the interior as well. We have a maximum foot candle of 20, 20 um, foot candles, a minimum of 0.1 with an average of 10.7. Remembering that the pool deck itself at the edge has to have a minimum of 10 foot candles per code. The, the whole point of the way it's illuminated is because of that requirement. And that was a change uh, from understanding the older code did not require these levels is a recent change that has required these, these increased levels at this pool deck. Um, in addition to the uh, uniformity ratios, um, max the average min ratio at 107 and the max min ratio at 209 based on that 0.1 low flow area. So um, if you got rid of the 0.1 and did some different things, those levels would go down um, obviously uh, and be more uniform. Um, and then once again, on the next exhibits, A24. Actually, A25. A25? A25. Oops, sorry. You're correct. <laughs> A25, once again, is sheet 8 of 14 with the light fixture details for the ground floor. And A26 will follow it, will be the same, same uh, the light fixture details for the ground floor, sheet 9 of 14. Once again, colored to show the lights proposed around the perimeter, uh, around the interior of the facility. Um, the blinds in blue are the pole mounted lights showing the light arrangement. Um, 
yellow are the gra uh, grazing lights on a on a 26 that are uploading the green wall on the southern facade um, the red lights are the lights above the cabana and by the kitchen the purple lights are the the uh, area lights on mounted on top of the bulkhead they're shined down to the pool deck and then the green light is the one uh, sconce essentially over the uh, or by the bathroom area And then finally, the roof deck. Mark this exhibit A27. This is the lighting plan for the roof deck, sheet 10 of 14, uh, submitted as part of the set. Once again, color added for clarity. Um, the items, the lights in blue again, are the po are pole mounted lights. They each have two fixtures on them, similar type lights in, that were on the ground floor along the west, uh, sorry, the eastern edge of the boardwalk. Um, they're, they're located underneath that shade structure that Mr. Handel testified to uh, previously. Um, each fixture is 36 watts LEDs with a 9-foot mounting height set to be under that 10-foot top of the, the, the shade structure in that warm white color. Again, the horizontal angles of the lights are shown on the plan in those dashed lines um, to cover and illuminate the area. The vertical angle is a 45 degree angle down towards the roof deck of those lights. Um, and the anti-glare visors and shields are proposed on those lights um, due to the being elevated above and to make sure it did not impact any of the surrounding uh, neighbors as well as anybody walking around the, the perimeter of the facility. Um, in addition, the green lights are overhead string lights, uh, 2.25 watts per linear foot. They're also LEDs. They are mounted overhead under the screen structure. They'll be mounted up about 10 feet between the poles supporting the, the structure back and forth. Um, and we'll get to show, you, show the detail of that in a second. They are a warm white, about 2,400 Kelvin. So they're even even a little more soft than all the area lights that are being that are proposed for the facility. And then the red areas um, around the the deck itself are low wattage area lights. They are mounted along the roof deck walls, I'm mounted a foot and a half above the wall. I believe Mr. Handel said the, the walls, I believe about three and a half or four feet high. So they're located th at the bottom there to locate the, the deck itself for pedestrian walking um, along the roof deck. They come with a 45 degree louver essentially directing the light downward. So you will not see the fixture um, across the way or even while you're walking next to it. Um, they are uh, 10.3 watts each LED fixtures again um, in that warm white color. The statistics up on the, on the roof deck consist of a maximum of 22.1, minimum of 1.6, an average of 10.3. Um, and the uh, uniform ratio is the average to min ratio at 6.45, the max to min at about 13.8. Um, did, you, did you separate the area under the, the canopy from the area along the walkway in the front, or did you add all the levels together when you did on this on the roof deck itself yeah. all the statistics are for the entire roof deck would you so. would you agree that it's going to be brighter under that canopy than it is along the front the maximum intensity levels are under the canopy due to those additional uh pole mounted lights mm -hmm. so yes if you ran the ratios differently the the areas around the perimeter would have a lower maximum um, than under that canopy that look at the plan with the point by point that is provided you can see those the levels um within those walk areas are still around uh, around 10 um along those walking paths but they're all just lights down to the deck of the uh, the material um and not low shooting up the lights not anybody's eyes uh, you wouldn't <coughs> I, I really don't recall where the, the the canopy is but you're saying the canopy which i know exists i'm just not quite sure where it exists here where and where the lights are the green lights that are there yes are essentially you have, you have the stairwell um, and the area in the, just behind in the bathrooms, I believe, to the, to the west. Okay. The areas with the green light, the green lights that go back and forth are essentially the canopy and sunshade that come forward to the east off of that, that right. front. So you still won't see those lights. The lights will the be, lights will be under, under the, the shade structure blocked by, essentially by the canopy, by okay, the, so by the no canopy and the structure. Um, so no one from above could see those lights either. They will not, yeah, they won't, they won't see the, yeah, the lights won't see the canopy will block, will screen them even, filter them okay. even further. Yes. Okay. Mr. Delaney. What I'm pointing to here, this is the bulkhead that extends above the roof deck. Is that accurate? That's correct. And the canopy is back behind the bulkhead, correct? That's correct. It's to the east of the bulkhead. And the lighting levels end at the 
walls of the roof because there is no spillage from the roof to any other point on the ground floor, right? Based on the, 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 the wall mounted lights, they're down a foot and a half and they're directed downward. Okay. So there's no lights above the top of the parapet that could Something. spill over. Gotcha. Um, the lights, the pole mounted lights are directed downward toward the deck in the angle. So the angles that are shown are where the light source would hit the decking. Um, so we're, you know, the analysis that was run assumed and then took into account things that might spill over. Um, and because the parapet <laughs> also blocks some of those lights at the ground level, when you got to those points, there would be nothing that would spill over. We did include those on the, the ground floor on the interior. Um, the levels, we did shoot, include any spillage, any potential spillage and the levels off into the boardwalk area, and they are very minimal on that east side. Um, and they- The upper levels? <laughs> the lighting from the upper levels on the spillage? For the- the, uh, onto the, onto the, onto the board the, at the ground level that includes lights from the whole facility all of that does not just for the ground floor just for the ground floor is for all the ground floor <coughs> lights uh, spilling over onto the boardwalk Would the there upper be level spillage from the upper level? i don't i don't expect any um because of the way the angle the lights are angled and the, the fact that the walls are up uh in three and a half four feet that would capture a lot of that light before it would spill over um, onto the pedestrian access points okay. <coughs> and then just to be complete, we'll mark the next exhibit is A28. Once again, these are the, the three fixtures, um, styles of fixtures proposed on the roof deck. The ones in blues are those pole mounted under the, the shade structure, uh, two fixtures on each of the poles. The one in red is the wall mounted around the, the perimeter of the deck, a foot and a half high. And then the green light are the string lights essentially above the, uh, in the, the screen canopy area. Um, just little decorative features to be turned on now. Those lights are, are there for decorative purposes only. They're not, they are not there to strictly to illuminate the area for safety. That's what the, the, the wall mounted uh, lights are for, as well as the pole mounted lights. Um, they just add a piece of ambience. They will add some light, fit, light to those areas, but it's not a substantial. Um, and they are controlled. Um, they can be turned on or turned off as needed. The other lights will be there on well, more likely for pedestrian safety and emergency access points. All right. <clears throat> so moving on beyond lighting, unless there's anything else I forgot to ask you on the lighting. Nope. Okay. So moving beyond the lighting, uh, the last area before we get into the professionals' reports that I wanted to address had to do with construction phasing. Uh, sorry, staging. Before I go there. Are there any permanent improvements associated with the beach club that are planned to be constructed outside of lot 1.23? No. Right. Uh, so we'll turn to the exhibit that <clears throat> we'll go ahead and mark A29. And was this a sheet that you had submitted previously with your set? Yes, this is a sheet 14, a four of 14. Um, entitled Construction Staging Plan, or the, the set of site plans both submitted with the original set and the revised plans. Oh. I'm going to ask you a few questions on this, and then I know we have some follow-up to it, but the, just looking at this sheet alone, are the colored areas associated with permanent improvements, or are they areas where there was going to be proposed temporary construction activity? In fact, all the, the items in color on this are all temporary uh, improvements that are related to the construction of the facility upon completion of construction all those areas that, that would be are needed to assist in the construction to aid, aid in it would be um, removed and sent back to what the final plan shows um, for as constructed so for example today if you're walking on the boardwalk past some of the other pavilions there's fencing on the boardwalk near the building that just keeps pedestrians from accidentally going onto the construction site. Is that the type of fencing that, that could be on a small portion of the boardwalk during construction? Correct. The the blue line with the X around the, the perimeter of the site and onto um, the portion of lot 24 uh, shown um, is a construction fence to, to separate the, the construction going on on the site from the public. Um, making it safe for them to continue to uh, walk up and down the boardwalk, walk up and down Ocean Avenue, um, access the access the boardwalk without um, coming into a dangerous uh, situation with the construction activities going on on the property. And what was the <clears throat> red area on this exhibit A29? The red area is a um, is defined as the construction and material staging area. So any of the materials that were needed for the con uh, for the for the site, uh, potentially piles. Um, 
building materials, uh, utility uh, structures or, or piping uh, would be laid up, laid on those areas on the uh, lay down pad that would then be, you know, when ready, would be installed on the site uh, to make way for additional materials in that location. And is it your understanding that the applicant, as a condition of approval, would be willing to uh, do that type of construction staging from lot 1.25 instead? Yes, it is. Okay. And lot 1.25 is owned by the applicant, is that correct? Yes. All right. And on here, can you sort of point out where 1.25 is located? So uh, the red area, as shown, doesn't go to the end of lot 1.24. It goes about three quarters of the way where the black rectangle is. On the right-hand side, that is a little bit into lot 1.25 and extends further to the north. So that red area would be shifting over to um, back to sorry. Yes. Um, the red area will be shifting over to where that that rectangle is for uh, construction staging of the property. Is that only if? I mean, what what's? Uh, I'm sorry, just to <laughs> understand what that meant. Does you mean that that you're going to stage at 1.24 lot 1.24 unless the city or no they're going to stage at 1.25 the, the uh, staging is being re re changed from 1.24 to 1.25 right, it's going to 1.25 yes mm -hmm. okay so that red area will move okay and that's for and the construction that is for construction yeah. trailering and trailer and staging uh, materials only um, so the area now that is red will now the fence line will actually pull back to um closer to that blue area okay. uh, which was the Good. the access and that will be left in its uh, current state okay. and are we seeking is the applicant seeking to put any permanent improvements on 1.25 no it will all be just was said temporary for the construction of the project okay. right. i would like to turn to a report that we received from insight engineering that is dated June 19th, 2019. Sure. Michael Sullivan, Clark Kitty Hinton, Board Jason Fisher, Board Engineer. Thank you. All right, and I'm referring to a report that was issued by Insight Engineering, dated June 19th, 2019. Let's mark that as well. Would you like to? Yeah, let's mark that, Michelle, as a board uh, exhibit. Okay, that'll be board. <coughs> board B4. Thank you. I actually don't have that shot. So we'll mark B4. Mr. Delaney, have you reviewed the letter that's been marked as B4? Yes, I have. Okay. And I believe you've addressed most of the comments that are in this letter, but I want to go through just a few to highlight. Sure. Um, Thank you. First, on page two, uh, where it's completeness review, there's a question about whether a signed and sealed survey was submitted. Um, did you provide a signed and sealed survey as part of the initial submission to the planning board? Yes, we did. Um, originally, I thought in the, in the first comment letter from uh, from Insight, uh, there was an error in the reference on our general notes to the survey, and it, I believe that they thought they were referring to they didn't receive that survey. Um, that note has been updated to the, the survey for this property. It was left though it was an errant uh, message. Apparently, the the board engineer still did not have a copy of the the survey. Um, for that so so just for the, the sake of the record and for completeness we brought extra copies of it that we're going to we'll hand over to the board secretary just in case and this is the boundary and topographic survey for Ocean <coughs> Avenue All right. Just for the record, too, this, this uh, Exhibit A17 that I was testifying to for was a copy of that of the survey that was submitted and that we are handing out. Uh, no, it's A17, so I don't think we have to mark that one. It's just a large size copy of A17 that's been signed and sealed. That's A17 in March. A17? Yeah, it's just an enlarged copy. Okay, this goes back to you. This is your copy. This is Michael's. You're going to. 
And this, again, was submitted as part of the initial package, correct? Correct. Um, yep. Okay. Uh, number seven. It was requested in number seven to provide soil boring logs. So as I testified to, I did look at some preliminary logs that were um, prepared back in 2018, uh, April of 2018. Um, that information, uh, Ms. Smith is, is, has copies that we'll provide. So we'll mark this as, all right, we'll mark this as A30. And just for the record, can you describe what A30 is? Sure. Um, A A30 is uh, six pages of test boring logs, borings numbers B1 through B3 that were prepared by French and Perillo Associates dated 4-10-2018. Uh, they show the um, <coughs> Uh, test borings that were done on the site. The three, um, these three are located um, along the western edge of the property, from from grade down to uh, 42 feet for 42 feet for borings one and two, and 52 feet for boring three. And on this, they do uh, indicate the depth of water at 10 feet on each of the boring logs, as I testified to. Okay, moving to comment 33, there were a number of um, suggested revisions for the stormwater report. Do you agree that all those revisions uh, can be made and updated in this stormwater report as a condition of approval? Yes, we will provide all that information to the board engineer. And everything would be consistent with how you testified today, correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. And I've just gone through the rest. There were a number of other items where testimony was requested. I believe that we have hit all of them except for the one area concerning landscaping, which will be addressed by our landscape engineer. Uh, otherwise, in the areas where um, testimony was not required, is it the applicant's position that they will require with all the remaining comments? Yes, it is. Okay. All right. That is everything I have for Mr. Delaney. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does the uh, do our professionals have any uh, questions? I asked all my questions throughout. So. Okay. No ma'am. No. Does the board have any questions? Question on the yeah. walkway in the front. Um, the 88 ramp um, is three and a half feet wide enough for for the ADA access. The regulations um, specify. Uh, they don't. Spe I'm not sure. They I'm not sure they specify a minimum. Um, obviously, it has to be able to to pass um, to, to walk safely along the walkway. They do have a require, new regulations. Recommendations are in there for having passing zones every 200 feet. The walkway is not 200 feet long, so you have a passing zone at the bottom and the top, which would comply with the regulations as well. Um, it's also not a ramp. It's not a handicap accessible ramp. It's really just a sloped sidewalk. Um, no difference than any, any concrete sidewalk or so on a, on a slight incline of a hill. Um, it's less than 5%, which does not meet the criteria of a ramp. Um, if it was exceeded that, we would have other other things to deal with, with with railings and handrails and stuff like that, and a lot more width requirements would come into play sure. on this. This is just a, this is just essentially a sidewalk up to the facility. Is there an opportunity to widen it if if that, if that was need if that was desired? I'm sure we could probably look into that and, and probably accommodate that. Okay. And just for clarity, you say it's not an ADA ramp, but it the slope sidewalk does comply with all. ADA requirements. Is that a correct statement? It provides it provides accessible entrance to the to the facility. Okay. Thank you. So you did. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, on the uh, eastern side, the eastern facade, there's two little notches on the on the, on the north and south. What is that? That's distance from the east. Just a little notch. 
Are you talking uh, on, the, on the for the building side? Yeah, like at, at where the uh, the easements are. See, they have that the little notches. That little right notch here? right there. No, on the on the eastern side. Yeah, that what's that setback? From the, uh, from that's the about I want to say it's about six feet. Six feet. Yeah, it should be on the survey. Um, so this is part of the property line. So on the south side, actually, it's six point one seven, and on the north side, it's six point two five feet. Um, I want to thank you for clarifying something from the um, testimony that was previously given so uh, by Mr. Handel, which is um, the deck is at 14.5 feet, but you did say that the lowest horizontal member is at 13 Correct. feet. Yes. And that's, um, it's important because this is in uh, a VE zone um, and it's not just about elevating it above still water, it's about elevating it to the point where wave action can occur because it's in a high velocity wave zone. Um, I just wanna ask about, you said that on the uh, west side of the building that there's a sloping up grade and soil so as not to see anything underneath the building. And I'm wondering if that's in compliance with having no obstructions underneath the 13 foot lowest horizontal member the the obstruction is only it's a, it would only be the uh, soil or, or sand that would be there's no any any constructed uh portion of the building if it extend down below there would comply with regulations that have to be break away and i right. believe mr handel testified that that it would be, <laughs> would be uh, we were just bringing the rate up to make it look a seamless uh, slope up from the grade to the to the building facade in that location, but anything below that 13 elevation would be a breakaway structure. So if any wave action or water came down through that area, it did happen to hit hit any structure there, it would be able to block it away and we push out any, any sand or soil that would be in that location. Well, I do think that small amounts of fill are are permissible as long as it's not structural fill, but it would have to um, match whatever was in your soil borings which was sick so you said soil it doesn't matter but it would have to be sand similar to whatever you found in your soil borings i believe i'm not 100 percent sure on what the material can be i know i know you can't raise grade um right. to to alleviate flooding problems in the site to to raise your site out of a floodplain and we're not proposing to do right. that it's just aesthetic right. purposes yeah. it's not structural support soil because the building right. is supported on piles yeah and you're totally yeah. permitted i mean for yeah. stormwater purposes grading whatever it totally makes yeah. sense that you would um regrade the site i just want to make sure that they're not obstruction right so the 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 purpose of the v zone it's not that you raise it above yeah. it's that actually you allow waves to go under it so i just want to make sure that there you're not proposing any obstructions that are below that 13 no, foot no permanent obstructions that would that would prevent any waves from going through okay so and no horizontal yes. members okay yeah, yeah. And the members i think mr Handel also talked about would be installed i believe a perpendicular to the beach right so they're, they're not horizontal which would you know if it does get up higher would hit those and hit into those members that be prep uh, Perpendicular, which allowed them to flow between the uh, the yeah. areas as well. So another, you essentially get another foot of you know, of clearance underneath there, um, and at the small end of the the, the supporting members. Good, good. Um, and then, I mean, the other thing is just, and I brought this up last time, but any fencing, anything that you're proposing that is within a, a V zone has to have openings in it. It's part of allowing flow to go through it so i just want to make sure even beyond like you know breakable frangible whatever material it also should be a lot it should be something that allows flow to go go through and that's one of the requirements of nfip yep. and fema and um i just want to make sure that we're we're meeting those those requirements in the design so it doesn't have to come back yes yeah, so a, lo a lot of the design um yeah, obviously, we, as Ms. Smith pointed out, we did submit to CAFR for, for our compliance statement to, to make to determine for them to determine if, if the site, as, as we propose it, is, is in full compliance with the CAFR permit and the regulations. So if they have any comments, we'll obviously address those. Um, in addition, the the final design, obviously, the structural design, some other things are still undergoing. We reviewed by the building department um, as we go, but we will. Uh, a condition of that is to confirm that all of the codes, FEMA codes, building codes, are fully compliant right. um which which is you know we've been tasked to do by the applicant jack if something is 
found to not be in, this is just a question about the procedural. So if something's found in the design to not be in compliance with FEMA V zone regulations, is that something that then due to redesign, it has to come back to the planning board or does it? Yeah, I think uh, the, the topic you're talking about with the soil, Yeah. if that became an issue yeah. down the road, they would have to lower the fill. How much, you know, we'll find out. Let's just say the soil came below, just enough below that you could actually see under the building. Right. Then they'd have to come up with something to visually screen that gap. And if that, if it, the plans came to me, say during the resolution compliance process, and I saw that, yeah, I wouldn't feel comfortable approving that. So I would right. have them come back here and let you guys take yeah. care of that. Okay, and I appreciate that because I do think it's important that one of the comments in the inside engineering memo was that the, the board engineer also needs to see the results of the CAFRA review to make sure that they're comfortable with it being substantially in FEMA compliance. And I think that's, it's important that it goes to the board engineer and the board, the board planner if we can require that as part of the condition. Okay. And as soon as we hear back from the DEP, we will copy the, the board on any correspondence from them. Okay. And then I just had one more question on stormwater. So um, you said that uh, anything above the two year, it would go above the two year storm, it would go to discharge on the north and south, which is the existing discharge that then goes off site. Where, where does the off site discharge flow to? Uh, one, one system on the south side heads down uh, Sixth Ave, one heads down Seventh Ave meets a block or two back there and heads north um, and eventually discharges into, I believe, in the Deal Lake and then out to, this, out to the, the ocean. And just for, when you say heads down, you mean underground? It's all underground, right. correct, yes. Through the, through the existing, the existing storm sewer network right. that, was part, that was installed as part of the overall um, redevelopment plan approvals. But it is possible that it could add to the overall discharge into Deal Lake above a two-year storm. Uh, based upon the, the permitted um, this is one of the comments actually Mr. Victor pointed out in his yeah. review memo to um, look at the pre and post numbers which we're going to provide to him. The site, as I mentioned, the overall redevelopment area is allowed 90% impervious coverage, you know, which means if you took it on a site by site basis, you could actually say each site has 90% impervious and then you have 10% grass if it went everywhere. Some sites are 100, some sites are you know, between 90 and 100, some sites are essentially, you know, 5 to 10% impervious because it's all land, walks with some walkways with open, open areas, parks and stuff like that. Um, so the whole area has been designed to provide uh, safe conveyance, um, not on an individual site level, but being that 90% is kind of a, a, a ballpark in there. As I mentioned, you know, we are 76 if we include the decking. If we don't include the decking, we're at 29% impervious coverage on the site. So we could go up to 90, so we're substantially below what could have been built on the site in terms of coverages yeah. for discharging off into that system. So. Um, Based upon those numbers, I'm comfortable that the system the site, the system that would have been designed, that would have been designed to handle a more intense, more impervious site um, development on this property, we're we're actually giving them le providing less water to those to those pipes, so it will not be a negative impact to the existing system. Does the board have any other questions? A couple simple ones. When you were talking about the lighting for the pool, you said in the deeper end. I thought at the meeting of the 29th, we were told the pool was four feet deep. Yes, the, the, that being deeper than the sun shelf, which is only maybe a foot deep. Or so. How long is the sun shelf? It's, look on the plan, you see the, the, uh, the lines on the north end, those are the stairs down to the, the bottom deck. So the area to the right of that is the, the sun shelf. Okay. It's got a little bit of, you know, a little bit of water in there. Um, people to put their chairs in to sit that don't want to get fully submerged. And then steps down to the then four steps feet. down to a four foot section. Correct. Okay. The new north ramp, you said it would be six inches of concrete with maybe some rebar or something to facilitate uh, emergency vehicles, be it police, fire or whatever. Is there going to be a calculated weight limit? I have not proposed any. Um, they designed it uh, similar to a driveway apron at, at for retail sites, uh, for um, residential vehicles that come up for sidewalks. You increase the sidewalks to six, you know, to six inches in thick, as opposed to a four foot. You throw some some reinforcing inside of it to withstand the the increased loads. Um, 
typically at a retail center, uh, a, a, something like that, you'd have larger vehicles, tractor trailers driving over them, um, you know, emergency vehicles, same kind of thing. So we don't expect it to be a, a heavily used vehicular path, but it can accommodate the occasional um, occasional vehicle on it um, for that for that use. Thank you. No. Let, let's say that um, a fire truck had to use. It. You mentioned that. Right? Worst case scenario, a fire truck had to go on there. Could we design that walkway to accommodate a just twenty loading heavy vehicles? I, I could six I, inches. I, of tow I can so I can look into it. See, I, I would think the six inches would handle it as well, but I can look into it further and confirm that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Just one last. So, and and also in the insight. Um, memo I think it acknowledged and no further signage was submitted as part of the application so you guys are still not proposing public access signage signage indicating what the building is numerical signage uh, there is actually a sign that was uh, shown on our landscaping plans that mr. Bauer can discuss when he comes up that uh, is something that we're putting up for the board's consideration and discussion uh, subject to perhaps uh, comments on how we may be able to better address what you're looking for, mm -hmm. but Mr. Bauer can address that. Okay. okay. The four lights along the east wall, you say they are tw they are 20 feet tall, and the wall itself is seven. S S seven and a half, I think, to that top, and a half. To, to the ultimate height. So, once those lights are on, you don't expect any spillage out onto the boardwalk. There will be some. Um, the, the lighting calculations on sheet 7 of 14 have provided the analysis of what would spill over, and those levels are, my eyes are going bad, are less than a half a foot candle that would get onto the boardwalk. And it's through those, you know, potentially the opening, because as Mr. Handel testified, the first six and a half feet would be solid, and the seven and a half would be the vertical slats that are extending up. Um, and so there would be the extra foot that would have, you know, some openings in it every, every so often. Um, so any light spillage that would come would come from there, but it's very limited um, coming onto the boardwalk area. Um, we, you know, we've tempted to, to screen them and shield them and angle them in a way that we, we would limit those from happening. Um, but sometimes just no matter where you put a light, sometimes you're gonna have some little bit of a light that, 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 that over we're trying to minimize. Um, and most of, the, most of the light spillage if, if on the plan, if you look at it, are down around the 0.1.2 range, especially you know away from the light fixtures. It's only at the light fixtures you have a little bit higher levels. Uh, and just to follow up on that, the I know the boardwalk plans for the city have not yet been finalized, but in the plans that have been submitted to the DEP for CAFR compliance, do they have the boardwalk lights in this vicinity anyway? We, we did show potential, I guess, possible future lights on the boardwalk that we anticipated might be included, um, and they are located along the you know, same, same boundary line. And they are uh, the similar fixtures that are on the, the north and south, uh, the classical globes, I believe, um, mounted with a height of 18 feet with the light fixture. Um, so they're actually gonna spill over possibly into our site a little bit as well. Um, but they, they would illuminate the boardwalk and, and really that would be where the illumination would come from, not from our site. I had a question about, um, uh, it's not something you testified to, but it's just related to utilities and this is an <coughs> ignorant on my part, but. Um, pool maintenance and water in terms of it goes to sanitary if you're draining the pool yes okay so it doesn't impact storm water at all no okay. <clears throat> is that is anything any different if it's salt versus I don't I don't believe so so either way same impact I believe so because they can always if you put salt now they can always change it over to chlorine later on so they don't want to if you do it one way you're, you're kind of tied in so I believe it's all connected into the, the, the sanitary for safety purposes. Okay. And it's accounted for in all the, um, the permits through the town for, for sewer capacity as well as uh, you know, any, other, any other permits related to sewer that would be needed. Uh, does the board have any other questions? No? Fresh balls, have any other questions? All right, I'm just going to propose that we take a short recess and uh, then we'll continue on. Five minutes, please. Motion. Do we have to do a motion? A motion for a recess. <coughs>
Five minutes. Second. Okay. Aye. 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 I think we need a motion to uh, open up again. Yes. Okay. Motion. Mo move to Second. Aye. 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 Here. Here. Jennifer Souter. Here. Uh, Here. Alexis Taylor. Here. Rick Lambert. Here. Barbara. Here. All right, we're ready for cross examination. Cross examination. Okay, where do you want me to go? Wherever you want. Well, Wherever. I'm not going to ask the applicant that question. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to grab a chair? Sure. Right next to you, Gordon. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Stuart Lieberman. I res represent the objectives um, in this matter. Uh, Mr. Delaney, I have some questions for you initially concerning the stormwater system. Um, you, you're aware of the best management practices, right? Yes. And you know that the best management practices are, is, constitute a guide by the DEP concerning the method in which stormwater systems are supposed to be designed. Isn't that correct? Yes. And you know that they constitute law, that they've been promulgated by the agency. Is that correct? <coughs> they've been adopted as, as guidelines in, in, in designing stormwater systems. And you understand that if you depart from the guidelines, you need to be able to state the reason for the departure as part of your work. Isn't that correct? Yes. And you understand that if you're using a retention system, that there's storm uh, soil borings that have to be undertaken underneath the location of the borings, isn't that under the location of the recharge device? Isn't that correct? It is correct if a product is defined as a major development. Okay, that's correct. Uh, uh, but but also, um, it's correct if you're relying on a recharge system. Isn't that correct? I believe the BMP manual and the stormwater management regulations relate to major developments only. And don't if you're not a major development, it wouldn't require. So um, as I testified, if you, if you use the 76% impervious coverage uh, conservative approach that we did, which provides 0.44 acres, we'd be a major development on the property. If we remove the pool deck, we would be not be classified as a major development. Okay. In this case, though, you're operating as if you're a major development. I made, I made that from a conservative standpoint, yes. Okay. Now, um, in this particular case, uh, you are relying on recharge for 6,000 square foot of the impervious surface, more or less. Isn't that correct? I am providing uh, a system that will allow recharge to occur for the roof drains of the building. Okay. So what I asked was correct. The answer was yes. I'm not relying on it. I am providing it as a um, an additional benefit to the development. Well, wait a second. When you say you're not relying on it, part of, you have a stormwater system which incorporates recharge, correct? I am not required under the regulations to to recharge. I am doing it as a an additional benefit to the site. Okay, good. So the system that you um, have put into place does not have any soil borings that were taken underneath where the basin, where the recharge basin is going to be, does it? There were three soil borings that were prepared back in 2018 in the vicinity of the of the uh, underground pipe. Okay. Now, when you say borings, they weren't borings in the sense of a soil boring that one undertakes for the purpose of installing a recharge basin, were they? They were not test pits. They were soil borings. Yeah, and 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 they were. And, and the difference is, is that test pits are of the nature that, for example, one uses when installing a septic system. Isn't that correct? They're roughly the same. Yes. And that's not what you did. What you did were you had engineers do geotechnical uh, 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 sampling in order to determine the integrity of the soils for the project. Isn't that correct? I did not have them do anything. The applicant contracted for that. Okay. And so, uh, so it's fair to say that as we sit here today, the storm, the soil, uh, the types of test pits that are anticipated under the best management practices have in fact not been undertaken in the area where the basin's going to be. In strict compliance, no. Okay. 
And um, you also know that uh, you have to have two foot of separation between the top of the stormwater and the bottom of the infiltration device. Isn't that correct? That is not correct. Um, the two foot separation is from the seasonal high water table to the bottom, to the lowest point of the infiltration facility. Okay. And um, the uh, when this work was undertaken, uh, was an assessment made to determine whether or not uh, you were uh, whether or not you were at seasonal high water. My understanding uh, from speaking to geotechnical engineers in my career, uh, and especially most recently, um, it, it, the seasonal high water table and and the estimation of that, of that is seasonally dependent upon when the borings are done. Ideally, borings are, are, you want to take your borings or test pits in the um, earlier part of the year through April, um, February, March, April, possibly even early May, because that is when the seasonal high water table is at its potentially highest on a property. Um, and from my discussions with geotechnical engineers about this, that water table elevation, seasonal water table also tends to coincide with the water table elevation on the site. The months on that were when? The preferable months? February through through uh, April, possibly into early May. And, and uh, you've, you've observed the uh, data from that, from that uh, those pits when they were undertaken, those borings when they were undertaken, you've personally observed them? The information that was uh, submitted here is one of the exhibits. I reviewed that information when it was provided to me. Okay. Did you actually see the data from the on-site work that was undertaken? I was not present during that time. It's not what I asked you. Did you actually see the data that was generated from the work that was undertaken at that time? The only thing I saw were the logs that were produced as a result of the uh, exploration. Okay. And the month of that was when, please? April of 2018. Um, and you understand that if, uh, if, uh, if you have a, a deficiency in terms of the uh, depth to groundwater, that affects the manner in which the infiltration basin will operate, right? Isn't that correct? If I don't have the separation, I would have to uh, modify the design to provide the required separation. Well, that's because the groundwater would infiltrate, would, would uh, displace the water that was trying to be recharged into it. Isn't that accurate? Potentially, yes. Okay. Um, and, and, and you can't state that based on your own work product that there in fact will be two feet of separation here, can you? You're not in a position to make that testimony within a reasonable degree of engineering certainty, are you? Based upon the information and the logs that was provided to me and the time of when the logs were taken, um, they indicate a depth of the water of 10 feet below existing grade. In the location of the, uh, the pipe system, the infiltration system that I'm that being proposed here, is on the low end of the site as I testified to at elevation 11, 12 existing. Therefore, the seasonal high or the water table that they, they determined would be down at elevation one or two. The bottom of my infiltration system is five and a half. Um, two to five and a half is three and a half feet, so there is some room there. I felt comfortable that as proposed, it would meet, meet any further testing or, or um, investigations that would be provided on the site. When the work was undertaken, the stormwater system had not yet been designed. Isn't that accurate? That is correct. And, um, and, and uh, uh, did you superimpose your, uh, dis your uh, discharge basin drawings of your discharge basins over um, any site drawings indicating where the samples were taken to ensure that the uh, samples were underneath the basin? Have you done that yourself? I did not do that myself, no. Okay, who did that? <clears throat> um, the geotechnical engineer would have done that. I don't know if he, he provided that information. Are you able in to- In final format. Are you able to state within a reasonable degree of engineering certainty that the soil analysis that was undertaken for the geotechnical review, in fact, represented soils that will be underneath the discharge basin in the system? So repeat that again. Are you able to state within a reasonable degree of engineering certainty that the soil log results that you reviewed constituted results from soils taken underneath where the discharge basin will actually be situated? Directly underneath, no. I don't. They were in the vicinity of, from, from my review of some information provided, they were in the vicinity of the of the proposed uh, recharge system. You understand that the best management practices, in fact, require that samples be taken underneath the discharge basin, not in the vicinity. I you understand I, that? I believe it allows some flexibility um, 
to move. It doesn't have to be directly underneath it. It can be off to the side, just as the septic systems allow some, some of them to be pushed out in case the system has to be moved. When there's resistance also. So in other words, if you, if you sense uh, some kind of resistance in the soil such that a sample right underneath where the basin's going to be is impracticable, there's going to be some resistance. Did you, there's going to be some opportunity to go to the side. None of that existed here. Isn't that correct? You're not aware of any of that. I'm not aware of any of that. Right. Now, um, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the soil samples, did, did they indicate the composition of the soils? In other words, what information were you able to, or can you provide today in terms of the composition of the soils? They did, the, they did a description of the soils for each uh, sample depth that they um, provided through their boring logs. Um, and those as submitted into the, the logs that were submitted. Um, there were several, most of it consisted of um, into the depths that would affect the stormwater basin down to that 10 feet, um, sand with some traces of silt um, in boring one, boring two, so again, some sand, some a little gravel and traces of some silt, um, and very similar to uh, in boring three as well. Now, um, you indicated that there was some gravel there. Um, this was a redeveloped area, isn't that correct? The, yes, I believe so. Um, can you tell me what information you have concerning whether, which would answer this question? Has there been any fill installed in the area where this discharge basin is going to be situated? Underneath it, right underneath it. Has there any historic fill or industrial fill as a result of the reuse? I do not, I'm not aware of any. It was not in the information I reviewed. Right. So the answer is you can't testify within a reasonable degree of engineering certainty as to whether there is any redeveloped fill in the area underneath where the discharge basin is going to be. You can't testify, can you? No, I can't because okay. the information was not provided to me and I did not perform the, the logs. Okay. You understand that in a redevelopment area, one of the reasons why recharge isn't necessarily required is because of the propensity for the fill to be historic reused fill. Isn't that correct? I'm, I'm not aware of that reasoning. No. Okay. But in this particular, you understand that if the soils constitute his reused soil, in other words, uh, what's your understanding? In other words, if, if it's industrial reused soil, it could have gravel in it. Isn't that correct? If it's a developed site, it could have fill, it could have gravel, it could have remnants of old structures. There could be var various materials underneath a, so a site that, that's being re that, is, uh, being, that was developed at one point is, that is being redeveloped. And the quality of the soils in that regard if, would directly impact the ability of those soils to recharge, wouldn't it? Certainly. And you can't state with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty before this board today as to whether any problems associated with the recharge system that you designed will exist or will not exist because of the quality and nature of the soils underneath the canyon. All I can say is based upon the information that was provided to me in these soil boring logs, um, the uh, material underlying it, consisting of sand with traces of silt and, and gravel, seems to me to be better than uh, most uh, possible redevelopment sites with um, large amounts of other types of materials, uh, more, restrictive, more restrictive materials or more um, materials that would not be suitable. You understand that in redeveloped sites, often the nature of the soils differs greatly depending on, it could be just within a few feet. Isn't that correct? Uh, test any geotech engineer, I say the only thing they can guarantee is the soil boring <laughs> directly when they t test it, so yes. Now, um, your, your, your uh, stormwater system indicates that uh, you have, uh, you've taken into account the 25 year storm event, right? Isn't that what you, that's what you, what you wrote, wrote in your I report? did that for sizing the roof leader system, yes. Okay, what you, you understand <coughs> that there are other uh, storm events, including a hundred year storm event. Uh, what, what happens to your system in the event of storms that exceed the 25 year storm event? What happens, what happens to the, the to underground the, system the, or the roof drain system? What, what happens system? to the water? If what, you what have system? A, well, I don't care the system. I'm asking you when you have water 
coming off the uh, coming off the impervious site as a result of a tr uh, storm that exceeds the 25 year event what happens to that water there are two situations here the right. the roof drains uh, for conveyance pipe design is required to uh, comply with, use a 25 year storm for um, proving capacity in the system for the recharge system the 25 year storm is you also have to look into the 100 year storm so i would not analyze the conveyance system for a 100 year storm because it's simply any of the root, any of the existing inlets and, and systems along the roadways are not analyzed that way. They're sized for a 25-year event. Stormwater detention and retention infiltration basins are are analyzed for up to the 100-year storm event. Okay, so th then let's get into the, the the nature of the municipal system that you're relying on. First of all, if I understand your testimony. That system, first of all, the system was designed by Shua De Palma uh, roughly 20 years ago. Is that correct? That's my understanding based on the plans that I had reviewed previously. And uh, the uh, stormwater <coughs> regulations that were in place when this system was designed aren't the same stormwater regulations that we have in place now, are they? Regulations change all the time. Uh, and, and they've become more stringent, especially along the coastal areas. Isn't that correct? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And the uh, you've indicated that uh, you believe that the receiving uh, the pipes, the receiving pipes that you're relying on for all but six thousand gal uh, square feet, all but six thousand square feet of this roughly nineteen thousand square foot of impervious surface. If I have my numbers right, most of that's going to go into the municipal system. Isn't that correct? Only six thousand square feet is going to go into the municipal system. The rest of it will be. Um, sent down into the, the underlying soils. The only part, the only part that will be going into the missile system will be the building, the covered portion of the building through the roof drain system, and the two walkways on the north and south ends that flow over land to the inlets. How many square feet is that? The inlet system itself, uh, the, the building is about 6,000 square feet, and I think, believe the, the two, um, remember my numbers if I remember let me just do about 3,000 square feet for the concrete I, the, the, the the recharge basins handling 6,000 isn't it, it, is that it it is only handling the runoff from the roof drains from the building the proposed building J just the recharge system the rest is going into the pipes the rest is going into the municipal system isn't that correct the rest of it being the concrete on the north and south sides are flowing over land by sheet flow into the existing inlet and pipe network system in Ocean Avenue. Okay, fine. Now, what have you done? This was one of the questions that the municipal engineer asked you too. What have you done to ensure that that system that exists today with whatever build outs have already been connected to it and are anticipated, what have you done to ensure that it can handle the water that it's gonna see from this project? As I testified to the, the uh, Waterfront redevelopment plan permits up to 90% impervious coverage throughout the entire water development plan, uh, waterfront area, um, which you can look as a whole. You can also if needed to apply individually to each site. Um, for the, in this case, we could do that. If at a 90% impervious coverage, we are at 76%. So we would actually be, you know, based on the original design that may have assumed the site is, as 90% permitted, we are 14% less impervious which would then have a less runoff going to that system. How, as I also testified to, we were being conservative with that 76%, and that actually, if you included the roof, the pool deck as a non-impervious surface, because it allows water to uh, drain off it and, and directly into the soils under, underground without going to the municipal system, the site would be under 30% at 29% um, runoff, which is substantially less than 90% impervious, would be a substantial reduction to any uh, flow that would enter the municipal system. Okay, so you understand that there's a difference between looking at something from a design perspective and looking at something that's already been constructed and determining what its capacity is, right? You understand that those are two different analyses, right? Yes. Okay. What is, what have you done to ensure that this system, which was built 20 years ago and is out there in Asbury Park right now, treat, surfacing a whole lot of storm water, what have you done to ensure that it in fact can take the water, all but 6,000 square feet of it that's gonna come from your project, what have you done to ensure that it can take it?
as preparation to other developments in Asbury Park that I've that I've been involved with. Um, I did review the original designs um, for the stormwater system on the site uh, for the entire development. Have had the documents. Um, this site was allotted with two roof drains, uh, two connections from the inlets uh, in the street up to service the proposed property. Um, so it was contemplated that development on the site would be running through those pipe systems. And as I said, as I mentioned, with the reduction of impervious surfaces on here based upon the anticipated impervious surface that could be uh, generated from or proposed on this site, we're substantially less of, and that itself would be a reduction in runoff to the municipal system. Okay, have you, you haven't done, how is the system working right now, the municipal <coughs> stormwater system? Current stormwater system, how's it work? I have not witnessed it in, during any substantial rain events. Um, I have not been made aware of any flooding or backing up uh, in front of my property or along the routes that the discharge pipes take down to the to the outfall. Well, you know that the discharge <laughs> pipes, even if you're relying on a design basis only, which I certainly don't think is a good idea, but even if that's all you're relying on, you know that they can't handle anything more than a 25 year storm. Isn't that correct? That is industry standard. Okay. So, so you know, right off the bat that when we have a storm that's greater than a 25 year storm, which seems to be every week now, that it's going to surcharge. That, that and every other pipe in the state of New Jersey, except DOTs, which are designed to a 10-year storm. But if you did more infiltration on the site, we wouldn't have that problem. Is that correct? I'm not required to do any infiltration on the site by the regulations. There was a recommendation by the TRC that we try to incorporate some recharge, and that's what the applicant has in the plans and submitted have done. I want to talk to you about the design features that you gave testimony about before some of the de design features and what I want to do is focus on the design features that you incorporated or that your firm incorporated that are specific to or peculiar to this use as a beach club that's what I'm going to focus on so when we look at the engineering we know that you have you know that in terms of pools We've had uh, uh, several regulations, safety regulations, that have gone into effect in the last year. Isn't that correct? I'm not a pool designer, so I'm not aware of all the regulations related to them. Well, when you say you're not a pool designer, you engineered a pool club here, didn't you? I, I, I did the engineering outside of the facility. The architect and other professionals on the design team handled the pool design, building design, the interior features I, I show, the, I, my role is to connect those improvements from the exterior of the facility to the public right away. Well, excuse me if you would, but you testified in fact that the lighting that was undertaken in the area of the pool was specifically designed to anticipate and address <coughs> the new pool requirements. That was you, your testimony, is that correct? I testified to that based on information provided me by our professional lighting consultant on our design team. So you don't consider yourself to be an expert in lighting or lighting engineer? I am knowledgeable in, I'm knowledgeable in lighting. I'm not an expert and I'm not a, I'm not a, a lighting engineer, no. What else was uh, done at the site uh, in order to address the recent pool regulations that you're aware of that your other professionals have told you about? You, you dealt with the lighting. What else? I'm sorry, just to object here. So our architect came in and gave testimony as to the, how the interior of the site was designed, including the pool. And he's been here and testified as to that. And Mr. Delaney has now testified that he's participated in designing the site, but questions about the actual pool design were appropriate perhaps for the architect. I don't mean the pool design. I mean the structure and the surroundings in light of the pool use, for example, Part of the testimony that we heard tonight was that the lighting was specifically designed to meet the 2018 uh, pool illumination requirements that the state passed. I want to know whether or not any other, uh, that you're aware of any other engineering features associated with this project that relate to the 2018 public pool requirements, other than the lighting that you testified about. I am not. Okay. Now, um, um, you've, you've also given testimony uh, about the, uh, the, the, the ability of this structure to withstand 
uh, storm events. You've given some testimony about that, isn't that correct? I did not give any testimony about the ability to withstand a storm event. I simply testified to the elevations that we are required to comply with in terms of flood elevations and FEMA okay. requirements. And, 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 and that's because FEMA focuses on a wave action and flooding, right? In the V zone, yes. Yes. And so what I want to know is this. You're aware of, of strong winds that associate are associated with these storms as well, right? I have to object. When you say these storms, these, it seems like a very broad and ambiguous question. Well, sandy kinds of storms, these uh, nor'easters and hurricanes and events that we've seen in the last few years. You're aware that it's not just flooding that's an issue. It's not just water action, but it's wind, correct? Storms such as that, you have both uh, water and wind uh, aspects, yes. That's right. And, and, and so what I want to know is you're the engineer. From an engineering standpoint, tell the board, if you would, what did you do to address the wind concerns associated with the storm events that you just described? I have done nothing to, uh, based on wind uh, related to the wind, as that is a structural aspect that would be handled by our structural engineer. Okay, but, but as part of the team, well, there's engineering components to it though, right? There's an architectural component, but there are engineering components associated with ensuring that a building is able to withstand hurricane or near hurricane forces. Aren't there, hurricane, aren't there as, engineering functions? As I mentioned, that would, be, that would be designed by our structural engineer, not outside of my purview. Oh, so, so you're not here to testify about the structural aspects of this project? I'm here only as the site civil engineer um, for, the, for the improvements around the perimeter of the building. Is, are we going to hear? Is there going to be a witness who's going to tell us about the structural aspects of this to ensure that it doesn't blow away during a heavy storm? Is someone going to tell us about that? Planning's board, the planning board's jurisdiction does not include the uniform construction controls. It is not a body. Of, this body does not review plans in accordance with the UCC. That is done in at the time that building permits are submitted. It is not for this board to decide. So no, there will not be a structural engineer that testifies here this evening, but all of the appropriate professionals who would prepare such plans in connection with the building permit will do so at the time of building permit submission. Does the board also, does the planning board also have within its purview and function the responsibility of ensuring FEMA compliance? because you gave testimony tonight about FEMA compliance. In fact, you, there was at length testimony about that. Yet that's not within the board's ordinary uh, responsibility, is it? I gave them information related to the elevations that we would be designing towards to comply with FEMA to answer any, some questions that were raised by the board and the public at, last, at the last meeting. Um, they, once again, as I understand it, the building department and, and city um, floodplain uh, manager would have ultimate review of any uh, code compliant issues related to FEMA. Going back to the engineering that you undertook of this quote beach club, and I put that in quotes, you, you indicated that there is no direct access, this was your testimony, that there is no direct access between this club and the beach. Isn't that your testimony? Yes. And in fact, the beach club, as you call it, doesn't sit on the beach, correct? Correct. And doesn't in any manner depend on the beach for its internal use as far as you know. Isn't that correct? It is designed to stand by itself. It's designed to stand by itself. And the focal point of this building that you engineered isn't the beach, but the pool that's inside. Isn't that correct? I, first of all, I did not engineer the building. Um, only did the site, as I talked about. And this is a, a private development um, by the applicant that the applicant is proposing to supplement the uses throughout the waterfront redevelopment area and work with the beach and boardwalk and other uses. One last thing I want to ask you about that. You used the word private development. What did you mean when you told the board that this is a private development? What did you mean by that? It is being constructed by a private developer with private money, not by, pub, not by the city or using public funds. And also it's restricted to the members. Isn't that correct? I never said anything about that. Do you know about that? I do not. In terms of the lighting, you're aware that part of this structure sits in front of an existing condominium complex, aren't you? Yes. 
Um, from a site engineering perspective, um, how much are you able to tell this board how much of that existing condominium's view, existing view of the ocean is going to be obscured by this development once it's constructed? That testimony was provided by the architect last meeting. And um, well, do you know? Testimony was provided by the architect. And um, in terms of the lighting that you talked about, there is some shielding that's taken place, correct? Yes. But the shielding will uh, not accommodate all of the lighting, and so there's going to be some lighting that's going to get away. Isn't that correct? Yeah, I have to object. What does get away? There's going to be some lighting that's going to not be shielded, and it's going to be visible from outside the project. Which lights in particular are you talking about, or which, which areas of the site are you talking about? How about, about? the upper deck? Those lights will have shields that direct the light downward. And what percentage of the lighting will be, in fact, shielded by those shields? I don't have that number. You don't have that number. Are you able to tell the board? So you know that the adjoining condominium isn't all eight floors. You know that some of it's four floors and some of it's eight floors. You know that, don't you? It varies in floor heights, yes. OK. Um, do you know, for example, uh, what type of hue will be present from this building, um, it, it, let's say, from floor eight of the adjoining condominium? I do not, but the architect provided information about that last hearing. Well, you provided lighting testimony. That was you. I did. Okay, so my question is, based on the testimony you provided, what kind of lighting are people going to see in the condominium from the eighth floor? Okay, do you have any testimony about that? All I can testify to is that the lights have been directed to point down towards the deck of both the roof and the pool. They are shields on those lights on the upper ends to prevent anybody in elevated positions, whether it's the third, fourth, fifth, eighth, whatever floor across the way from potentially seeing those fixtures. When are the lights going to be turned off? Do you know? I do not. Let me check my notes, see if I have any other questions. You're familiar with the concept of tail water inside the existing drain system, aren't you? Yes, I am. And, and, and what would you describe for the board what tail water means? Tail water is um, existing flow within a pipe that when another pipe enters it could potentially impact the rate at which the water from the incoming pipe enters the existing pipe. And an analysis in terms of one undertaken by one who typically designs a stormwater system relying on pipes for conveyance would out of necessity also anticipate an evaluation of the tailwater and its impacts, wouldn't it? Yes. Would you just would you provide to the board the tailwater analysis that you undertook for this project? I did not perform any tailwater analysis on this impact because the pipes that we are connecting into are the upstream most ends of the pipe run. Now the uh, the this well when you say it's the most up upstream portion, are you telling me that if there are uh, tailwater impacts down gradient <coughs> downstream, it's not going to have any impacts on upstream? Is that what you're saying? It potentially could, but there are there's no upstream pipes additionally flowing through our site, so we did not account for tailwater. You didn't account for it. So you're not able to advise the board what impact would be anticipated as a result of this tail order. You can't say within a reasonable degree of engineering certainty what if any impact is going to occur, can you? The impact that I would expect because it's a tidally influenced um, system is that any water that would be within the system would, would uh, have opportunities to discharge um, during those fluctuations in the tides, um, similar to uh, other other water bodies, such as rivers, um, that are tidally influenced. Right, that's commonly the cause, but that doesn't negate the fact that, that, the, imp that the tailwater still has an interim <clears throat> impact. Isn't that correct? It could potentially. Now, um, Are you familiar with something called, and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not that familiar with it, so don't, but are you familiar, are you familiar with something called the Del, Mar, the Del Marview Unit Hydrograph method of, of uh, doing stormwater analysis? I am familiar with the Del Marva Hydrograph, yes. And do you have an understanding that the best management practices 
require um, that that system, excuse me, that that mode of analysis be used in estimating runoff volumes um, in, in, in certain areas, uh, based in the coastal plain areas of New Jersey. It is recommended that the coastal plain areas use the Delmarva unit hydrograph. Um, however, there are the, some information and uh, guidance that was provided by the NRCS, I believe, um, for New Jersey, indicated that if a site is um, being redeveloped or an urbanized area, um, that the, uh, the standard unit hydrograph which is an acceptable method um, for those specific instances. Do you know whether the Department of Environmental Protection has amended its best management practices to coincide with that view? I do not. I don't have any further questions. Thank you for your courtesy. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, we'll open it to uh, public question. Uh, please, if you, uh, if you have a question, please keep it to whatever was presented. We would need your name and the address uh, of where you live. Uh, good evening, uh, Warner Baumgartner, Fifth Avenue. Uh, could you go back to the site plan, please, to the uh, very first slide that shows the uh, building? This one is the survey. Is that what you're looking for? No, the survey, the site five, plan, five the survey. Yeah, uh, that, that'd be fine. That yeah. This one. Uh, what is the western frontage of the building? What's the length of the building along the western side? It occupies most of the frontage. Uh, about 215 feet. About 215. Okay. And how wide is the lot on that frontage? 248 feet, as I testified. Okay. So that accounts for the 215 foot wide public easements correct and there's and the building is stepped uh, about a foot and a half on each side off of those easements okay um across the street to the west the condominium complex what is the frontage of that building i don't know and why is that not as part of your analysis because that's i'm not designing anything across the street okay um just a point of order, at the last meeting, I had asked the architect the same question and I was directed to the planner. It was love for, for lighting? No, no. For what? Alignments, property alignments. There was a great, there was a lot of testimony by this witness about uh, setbacks and mm -hmm. property alignments on the site. <coughs> and uh, I'm wondering what the relationship to this building is to the one to the west okay. in terms of how the frontages line up with each other. I, I remember that question. Yeah, recall well, that. And, and I guess they were going to. Have to I was directed that. to this witness. I understand at that time. I in terms of the frontages, the the there would the relationship is not uh, would not be the same. Would not be held under the same constraints. Um, we have a twenty foot easement along the front of our property, which is our constraint. Um, well, I do I'm not. I'm not aware of any easement along their property. I believe they could build all the way up to the property line, um, but I don't know the distance from the curb line to the property line for that for that site. I'm not referring to the um, easement between Ocean Avenue and the building. I'm referring to the, the site line alignment between the two buildings viewing uh, from uh, west to east toward the beach. So could you just, um, just, just for my own edification, what, what are you specifically looking for? I get site line, but what do you, I mean, are you well, clear I, as to I what don't the wanna, question is? I don't no. wanna reach into testifying. I'm, I'd like to ask questions. I understand. Um, I just, I just, okay. I just wanted to make sure that the question is clear. That's all. Yeah, okay. I said, okay. And honestly, we did okay. know, we noted your question last time, and I thought that you were asking about the setbacks along Ocean Avenue on the 
Ocean Ave side, which is what Mr. Delaney testified no. to. Let, let me let me go a different route. Um, you had testified earlier uh, extensively about CAFRA compliance. How, how is CAFRA compliance done with a project like this? The permit is very old, correct? When was the permit issued? Two, no, two, early 2000s. Early 2000s. And it, there was testimony that that permit is still valid. However, I heard some testimony from you that this particular site will undergo an additional review for CAFRA compliance. How does that work? It, perhaps I can jump in there. So as part of CAFRA compliance, the plans for this particular site, and I apologize, I'm sort of speaking away from That's you, okay. but not on purpose. Just trying to get picked up by the microphone. Uh, as part of CAFRA compliance, we need to submit the plans for this individual site to the DEP to confirm that they are consistent with the permit that was previously granted. Okay. So, so who at this juncture has reviewed those requirements to find out ahead of submitting to the state whether this project complies with CAFRA? In effect, you'd want to know before submitting it whether you're good to go, right? Yes, the, the design team consisting of the architect, myself, the planner, landscape architect, and all the other um, design team members, as well as the applicant uh, and our attorney, have reviewed regulations related to this project to, okay. that we feel are, the design is, com is compliant and we have submitted to the DEP for their um, review and, ho and hopefully approval and an acceptance that, that okay. is, that thank, is the fact. Thank you. So your expertise is with the site plan, the, the layout? Correct. Okay. I'm just going to run, get my tablet for a moment. Okay. Are you familiar with the uh, CAFRA chapters or sections that are specifically um, spelled out in the redevelopment plan? I'm aware of them. I do. Not, I have not memorized them. Okay. Are you, does one called uh, scenic corridors uh, refresh your memory? Yes. Natural resources and scenic corridors. Okay. Um, are, are you aware that that specifically states that the ends of the flare streets are to remain unobstructed? That there are supposed to be open scenic corridors at the ends um, when constructing any building between Ocean Avenue and the boardwalk. I'm aware of that, and I believe the design complies with that. Okay, uh, back to the frontage. It's 215, you said? The building is 215 approximately. The frontage is 248. Okay, um, and you're not aware of how the frontage of the building across the street, how large that is, are you? I'm not. Okay, so how can you confirm that there's no obstruction of a sight line if you don't know what the building across the street width is? North to south. If, if I may, Mr. Delaney, is this the curb line for the block across the street? That is. And is this over here the curb line for the block across the street? That is. Okay. And is our building within those curb lines for the block across the street? Yes, it is. Uh, the curb lines don't matter. It's the building size that matters. If I, if I understand the regulation correctly, and, and, and don't, don't, I'm not quoting it, um, and what we're going to be able to plan, and Mr. Hughes might be able to touch on this further um, later down the road, um, we have to maintain a corridor through the site. I don't, do not believe there is a specific width of each corridor that has to be maintained along those areas. That's, that's my understanding of it. We are maintaining a corridor because we're building up to where we can build, maintain the 15-foot easement, and the two properties to both the north and south of us are, I believe, are, are public property that, are, that are, not, are not proposed for development. Okay, you had testified earlier that you're allowing the easement lines to dictate your setback. That is correct. And you're now testifying that the actual site line from the west of this property has not been considered. I did not say that at all. I just, I just said that we, in our estimation, the sight lines are, have been provided based upon the design we proposed. Okay. Let, let me propose a hypothetical then. If, if the building across the street were 200 feet wide and your building is 215 feet wide, isn't that an obstruction? It depends on where you measure the site, site uh, views from. If you're measuring along a building, 
potentially. If you're measuring at a different point, if it's not along the building, that is the requirement of the sight line, then no. So your, your, belief, your belief is that a sight line can vary depending if you're standing in the middle of the street versus sighting along a building line. What, what's the generally accepted uh, way of determining a sight line along it, a building line, isn't it? Yeah. It is dictated typically by regulations on where those sight lines are to be measured from. I'm not aware that this is measured, is the, the sight lines for this are measured along the building lines. Okay. Um, re regarding the lighting uh, testimony that we gave, <laughs> you had specified specific lighting to light up the easements, uh, that is the public sidewalks. Could you go back to that slide that shows those fixtures? Uh, the green, yeah, the, the green line there. Could you go to the fixture that uh, will be in that locality? Next page. Okay. You had testified that these wall fixtures will not um, provide lighting outside the boundaries of the easement area. Is that correct? I did not say that, no. Okay. What, do you, what is the actual um, testimony about these lights? How, how visible will they be? I, the general public. I, I said these lights would provide illumination along the walkway that uh, might, might encroach over the property line to the north, and they'll supplement the pole-mounted area light um, to provide safe illumination levels okay. along the walkway. Is it possible to zoom in on that particular green circled area there to show the manufacturer's um, depiction of the light fixture? Oh, I think right, you right, skipped. A a, I think actually. you skipped ahead a slide back or two. Two slides. <laughs> there we go. The green one. Could we zoom in on the manufacturer's um, depiction of the fixture in the green square there? All the way down the bottom. Yeah, on the next sheet. Would be. There we go. Okay, so move left a little bit to show the light, the actual picture of the light fixture. No, nope, that's not it. Page up two, two sheets of light. Keep going. Oh, she should be that one here. Yeah. Oh, right there. That's the light. Yep. Okay, there we go. Can we zoom in on that uh, manufacturer's depiction? Sorry, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I, guess. I guess uh, I guess dragging with a mouse isn't uh, conducive yeah, to this particular. Go to, go to your left a little. Go this way. I think I just go down now. Yeah. Give the picture of the box. There we go. Ah, there we go. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Okay, so this is the fixture that you're proposing to put on the north and south facades to illuminate the public walkways, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, it appears from the manufacturer's data sheet here that this is a visible light source from, from underneath and from the side. There's a, it's an unshielded bulb, is that correct? Clearly, I can see the source of the light. Yeah, no, I'm seeing the source. Yes, the picture shows that. Yes, I'm not. I'm just not con sure that the fixture itself does not have the options available. Does not have some kind of a um, recessed option or a uh, shielded option. Okay. Would you say it's it's not advisable for good lighting practices to see the source of the light? Typically, you would not want to see the source. That is correct. Okay. So what are you going to do to mitigate this particular fixture? The, the, uh, as I testified to, these, these lights um, are only 10 watts each on LED fixtures. Um, I believe, and 
my math is correct or my memory is correct, the equivalent to that may be something of like a 40 or 50 watt. I'm, I'm not interested watt. in the wattage. I'm, I understand that, yeah. a 60, 60 watt bulb that would be in your lamp table next to your house. Okay. Is there not significant source of, of, of light, uh, light glare that would be coming out of the fixture? Okay, so uh, equivalent of a 60 watt bulb, a bare bulb? Would somebody have a bare 60 watt bulb sitting in a lamp? If you're standing directly underneath it or next to it, there would be an impact. Mm -hmm. But if you're five, 10 feet away, the impact is, is drastically reduced. Okay, let, let's, let's back up a second. You, you said it was desirable to not see the source of the light. What are we gonna do about this fixture to not see the source of that light and only the effect of the light on the sidewalk? Perhaps a shield, a shade, or a different fixture perhaps? I guess the question is, has this light been designed to provide safe passage for pedestrians along the access way? Yes, it has. No, that's, so, not my, that's not my question. What is going to mitigate the glare and seeing the source of the light? I, I, do, I don't believe being, being the wattage that is proposed, the glare that will be generated from the fixture would not be substantial that would impact the pedestrians walking up and down the walkway. Will there be an impact of course there's always an impact when you add something that's not there but the would it be significant that would impair pedestrians i, I do not believe so the way, you don't believe and the so. way that it is proposed and the way the way we've discussed it and designed this the light fixtures all right thank you um regarding uh signage which was testified to uh isn't there a minimum requirement to have at least a uh, building number on this facility i did not testify to signage there was commentary about it yep. i Correct. did not testify to it we okay. indicated that our landscape architect will be addressing signage oh okay i think it was i guess it was you that mentioned signage then <laughs> in your intro sorry okay uh regarding the water for the pool when the pool is drained for maintenance or cleaning or uh put into hibernation, where does that water go? The pool uh, system would be connected to the sanitary sewer system as required. Okay, and what, what will meter the flow in order to charge and bill an appropriate amount for the use of our sanitary system as everybody else is required to do? As part of our approval, we have to include the um, capacity of the pool in our calculations for determining sewage flow rates from the site that will be reviewed by the city engineer. Oh, I see. So there'll be some sort of uh, agreed upon gallonage, and whenever the pool is emptied, you'll be billed for that. The, the connection fees, uh, if any, that would be required for the site related to sanitary sewage would include any uh, volumes and demands required for the pool. Well, I'm, not, I'm not inquiring about connection fees. I'm, inquiring about usage fees like every other taxpayer has to pay for the water that goes down the sewer a sewer charge it's not a connection fee there just i don't think there are any special considerations for paying for sewage for the site they, whatever whatever everybody else is being charged for theirs they would be hooking into the same system and being charged. okay so you'll have a uh, an independent water meter from the water utility then yes and that water will be metered Yes. Fill this pool. Yes. And then that will be the basis for the sewer charge. If that's how the city calculates it, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Okay. All right. Just uh, another question about the interior lighting. Uh, the poles that you were referring to that are approximately uh, 19 feet high, I believe you said. the uh, small light fixtures that are on there. Um, they are in effect uh, spotlights, are they not? Little focused spotlights between four and five you had mentioned? They are individual, individual area lights that will be mounted onto the poles. Okay, and they will also be shielded or somewhat um, hidden from view? They will have a shield over the top of them um, and they will be directed downwards to the interior of the facility. Okay, what about from the side? What about being viewed from the side from people traversing the boardwalk? From the boardwalk, they wouldn't see them because the, the lights are directed away from the boardwalk. Okay, that's your belief in design. <clears throat> if something is angled away from me, I typically don't see <laughs> the sources here. 
uh, if a source is facing in a direction opposite of where I, uh, from where I'm standing, mm -hmm. yeah. then I typically would not see a source. Um, all depends where the bulb and the lens is, correct? Correct, but if you're walking the boardwalk, right. you, typically the lights are pointing interior okay. to the interior. All right, just, just one last item then, back to the, the, the view corridor. So if the architect uh, was not ready to testify about preserving the mandatory view corridor down the flared streets, and you are not prepared to prepared to testify about that. Who exactly? Uh, one of, which of your professionals will be addressing maintaining the required view corridor at the end of the avenues? Now that I understand that your question is about view corridors and not about setbacks, mm -hmm. we do have our planner, Mr. Hughes, who will be testifying. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Dave Ziegler from 4th Avenue. Okay. Um, question, you're a civil engineer or a site engineer? Uh, a civil engineer, engineer. focused on site development. Why are you testifying about lighting? Isn't that a, an, a, sort of a, an electrical engineer? The, the wiring system for it, is, it would do that. The um, electrical engineer would wire it. The fixtures themselves um, are either sometimes done by a lighting consultant um, in the case of our application, we have they have a specialized consultant uh, that I've been consulting with and working with um, to understand the, the system that they're proposing and, and offer comments to. Um, there are situations, area lighting for parking lots where I do, um, I'm involved with the light fixture selection and the light designs. Okay. I mean, typically, I, I, I lost a restaurant. I, I had to rebuild it. It was a six and a half million dollar restaurant. So I went through all the stuff you guys are doing, but I had an electrical engineer that handled lighting, that knew about lumens. It wasn't my civil engineer. He handled, you know, stuff underground and the sidewalks and access and all the stuff that you testified about, not lighting. Uh, I'm, I'm testifying to the light poles and the fixtures, not to the how it's wired together. Um, and it's in consultation with the lighting professional um, on our design team that I've been working with. I can understand testifying about, you know, making sure the sidewalks and, you know, the boardwalk have lights, but why, why, why are you testifying about the second floor lighting? Questions were raised. It's part of the it's part of the application um, that we provide lighting for, uh, on the site for our, for our um, for the use of the facility. And questions were raised by the board and the public during previous applications and I have heard in previous hearing. Um, as I mentioned, I've I've worked with and reviewed the lighting design by the lighting consultant and offered um, suggestions and and comments on the on that design in order to prepare myself to be able to testify um, on what is being proposed for this application. Will we have a chance to review this with an actual engineer that's responsible for electric? No, the, when it comes to the wiring of the lights, that is a construction code okay. question, and those that's reviewed by the construction department in connection with building permit review. The other question I have is, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of land on water, and typically you have to put tanks underneath it. To, to help the, to help drain the runoff that absorbs through the through, through the through the land, are you familiar with that? I am. We actually talked about that. that that's the uh, the infiltration system that we are proposing for the roof drains. Okay. And how many gallons can that handle? Uh, gallons, I don't have off the top of my head. Um, I have cubic feet. Give me one second. The, the system uh, as a whole is able to store a total of uh, 900, just over 900 cubic feet of, of runoff. How many cubic feet is your pool? I don't have that number off the top of my head. But the pool is, but the pool is not connected to that system anyway. I know it's not, but if you don't drain enough water, your pool is going to pop out of the ground. That, that's an issue. If you don't drain enough water that comes up to your pool, it's going to pop your pool out of the ground. So I'm, not, I'm not understanding the question. No, you have one person questions. So, if so you have another question, question that's fine. You can is, come up. If the ocean comes up or excess rainwater comes in, the, the ground can absorb it and properly drain it back out. If, if you don't have a proper drainage and your pool is over the cubic footage of, of what these tanks can handle, what, what's going to happen when the water in the land gets filled with water? Your pool is going to pop out of the ground. The, the pool, I believe the, the, the architect had testified to this, um, 
last hearing, the pool will be pile supported independently of all the structures designed to meet codes and resistance. Um, so it will be attached to the pile system underneath there to prevent, I believe what I understand is maybe some uplift or, or um, of the pool. If should, water should. does, it makes other water flow. Correct, and I think you're talking about maybe if the, the, the water table comes Correct. up excessively high. Um, yeah, the, the, the structural engineer will account for that uplift in their design of the connections to the piles with the pool. So if there's a 10 foot swell, your pool is just gonna stay there. That's, that's the, they will design in accordance with all the like, well, building codes and FEMA regulations to uh, comply with those, uh, that's that, so to prevent so that from happening. That's correct my statement. You don't know how much cubic feet is in the pool, how much cubic foot of water is in the pool when that I don't personally know. I haven't, I've not calculated that. Who, whose specialty is that? The structural engineer would be handling that with, the, with the architect. And the architect also gave the dimensions of the pool, the length, the width, and the depth. So I don't have that math off the top of my head, but it was in the transcript. Okay, all right, thank you. Anyone else? There's a couple questions about the pool. Mm -hmm. um, your name, your name Rob and Rob Taylor, uh, I live on 1501 Ocean Avenue. Okay. Uh, right across from you guys. Uh, so I'm looking, can you back to the pool, the whole map you started with for the pool design? Because from what you said before, you talked about FEMA water, water and water, uh, because of the, what we're, the type of zone we're in, that the water has to be able to move underneath the structure. Is that correct? Yeah, that's good. The water has to be able to move beneath the structure to wave, to allow for wave action? There are, if the pool was connected to the building, there would be different criteria associated and if the pool is separate and not connected to the building. I didn't ask you about the pool. I asked you, does the waves have to go underneath the structure? I'm getting to that, sir. Um, with the, the FEMA does allow pools within their, uh, within the V zone that are individually pile supported um, to extend. Um, they do have regulations that govern this, this situation um, and the pool is being designed in accordance with those regulations. And you talked about boring samples, correct? I did. Were any boring samples done that would allow us to understand if the proper soil in, is in place to allow for a pool to be supported there? The pool will be pile supported, so it doesn't matter what the so underlying soils are. Pardon me? The pool will be supported by piles. It will not be, it will not be sitting on the existing soil. So what is supporting the piles? The piles will be uh, um, driven into the ground until they, until they, my understanding of it, um, not, not the geotechnical or structural engineer, the piles would be driven into the ground until a suitable resistance is met that would meet the, the bearing capacity of the structure it is designed to support. What happens if the pool fails? We talked a lot about water retention here and that. The, what you've the, got uh, a pool that is being supported by pilings. The pilings are designed to move by nature so they don't, you know, uh, they don't shear, correct? That's how you design pilings. I, I don't know. I don't design pilings. <laughs> and you don't know anything about the borings either. I didn't. I didn't perform the borings. I just reviewed the information that was provided to me so from the geotechnical know. engineer. So who would know as whether the who would be talked to about whether or not that the pool can be properly one supported with the wave structure? If there's waves, would it be able to go underneath the pool? My concern is that you're basically creating a structure, right? that is not going to easily move unless you allow it to break away, right? That's going to be met by a water force. The water force is gonna overlap that at some point in time. Now you have chemicals in the pool. No one's discussed about how we're gonna take care of the pools. I keep hearing about letting the pool water run off into the impervious areas yet. I don't understand how you're handling the chemicals in that water that's going to go then into the ground. Usually they don't allow pools to drain around there for that very reason because they can't from what chemicals are in the pool, they all start to be concerned about how chemicals enter the pool and make sure that doesn't happen. So I've, I've got a lot of questions about it. You keep mentioning about but with the you know, your light on the impervious coverage and that could get lower if we let the water go through, but you haven't addressed, I think, how that would work. Well, I didn't address anything about the pool. Yes, uh, you did. You said that you could have impervious coverage around it. So there go, you did. So can you or can't you? I said I didn't. Uh, you know, let me finish, sir. Um, I did not address anything about runoff from the pool going into the ground. I was referring to rainwater that would come from the sky. And obviously, 
if we have a, a large storm, some type of wave action, the water that's in the pool is going to have ocean water come in or rainwater come in, and the pool water is going to come out, it's going to have chemicals in it. What's the plan? That would be set up by the, the operations uh, folks uh, for the facility um, in the event of a storm. You know, possibly they'd have, a, they'd have some kind of a system set up where they would possibly drain the pool as necessary to prevent that from happening or other mechanisms to do that. I am not, I'm not uh, privy to that maintenance and operations of the facility. So now the other thing I think one of the other gentleman was talking about before is that pool is really a boat because it has to be, it has to be able to hold water correctly. So it has to keep, be able to keep water in, it has to be able to keep water out. And what we were talking about before is if the, uh, if the, if the ta water table gets high enough, that's gonna start to float. And I don't care what you think you've attached it to, uh, as you, the question I have is this, the pilings you're putting it on may be designed to hold it up. What's being designed to keep it down? The structural engineer will look, looks at all, both uplift from groundwater that comes up so it does not um, support as well as any weight from below so it does not sink. It's all part of the structural design that's handled at, building, at the time of building permits. And we talk about groundwater, you're also talking about any type of water surges from the ocean? Correct? Yes. Okay. And that's been considered already? The structural engineer is, consider, is working on that, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, and what's the, um, the depth of the pool is how long? The steepest point, I believe, is four feet, as the architect testified to. And how long? I don't know the, the overall dimensions. The architect testified to the pool, its construction, how it's being supported, and the size of it last hearing. So you're going to have, my, here's my concern, is that you're going to have, under, at the water level, closer to water level, you're going to have a double-walled, secured structure to pilings that is not going to allow the free flow of water to go through that's going to become a wall. It's going to be create uh, an issue on those pilings. It's going to create a lot more force than I think uh, is being appreciated here. The, the pool will be designed in accordance with FEMA regulations, which allows for this situation. Uh, uh, oh, again, how long is the pool? I don't know off the top of my head. Who would know? It, it was in the record from the didn't the you architect. change the, the, the pool designs? You said at the beginning of the meeting you changed some of that. The architect addressed that in the last meeting. He testified as to the current length, width, width and depth of the pool. But didn't design. you say that you changed that? The width of the pool changed. It width. got it got smaller width-wise. Not did not change. I'm sorry, just to clarify. Not from the last hearing. It had been okay. originally okay. designed months ago to be wider, but between the last hearing and this hearing, the pool size has not changed. All right, that's uh, all the questions I have for now. All right, we're, we're getting very close to our, our 10 o'clock mark. Um, what's the right, consensus here? Madam Chairwoman, I, I... One more. One yeah. more? Uh, how many, okay, we have one more question, and then uh, I, I that'll would, bring us to the 10 o'clock mark. I, I would have to ask though that there are people in the audience here who have waited to ask questions. If, if there are, I guess, there's an idea of how many people are If you could give me just like some idea of how many how many people are we talking about. No, you're going to be here to midnight. No, yeah. We'll take one more and then we'll carry. This will be a quick. This will be a quick one. I'm Diana Patet, 321 Sunset Avenue, and it's connected to the pool and the covering around it. And you mentioned that it's a it's now a permeable covering. That's a change. Could you say what the material is, how it's permeable? And is it 100% permeable covering, please? I, I believe the architect talked about the, the decking at the, at the previous hearing. Um, it is not 100% impermeable. If it's a deck to walk on, they will have openings within the deck. And so there will be some water runoff that needs to be handled. And I don't think you mentioned what's going to happen to the water runoff from the decking. Water runoff from from where? Well, if it's not a if it's not 100% permeable, there's going to be and if there's a a storm or if there's going to be storm surge or whatever what's going to happen to all the water on the decking that water will uh, percolate down through the travel uh, through the decking to the underlying soils and percolate down into the groundwater but if it's not a hundred percent isn't there going to be still flooding in the area that it won't be able to trickle down with the loss with the uh, with at right speed the the decking allows water to trip to pass through to the underlying soils, the decking itself is not 100% impermeable. 
impervious, but there, it's like it, it's equated to your a deck at your house. There's always a uh, in your backyard. There's always a, a gap between the boards that allows water to run through. This will function the same way. Right, I understand that. But again, if you're going to have heavy rain, that will take a long time, and there'll be water that'll be on the deck um, that you probably would need to clear for guests to come to the pool. I do. The water will, water will hit the existing soils and, and percolate. There's capacity to get there. The water will, will drain down through through that. The water table, as through the soil borings that were performed, indicated it's 10 feet deep. So there's sufficient uh, area in the or available space in the underlying soils for that water to percolate down. Okay, so you seem to be quite confident that there's going to be no issues of flooding around the pool in, in a storm. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, uh, we're at the 10 o'clock mark. Um, Can I just say one thing? Certainly. I appreciate uh, the applicant saying that was addressed at the last meeting. There's some people here who weren't at the last meeting, and we have so many different packages. And I would think if you guys can't do it, then we have to do it. If somebody asks, like, how big is the pool? I got 15 maps up here, and mm -hmm. I can say it's 25 by 100. So, I, we, I mean, why is it so secretive? Why it, can't? It, it's not Mary. If you right, if you want us to take the time, we can pull it up now. It, no, okay. Well, I just answered. Yeah. It's twenty five by hundred. But I mean, yeah. stuff like that. I think it's twenty one. Twenty one. Okay. Yeah. I, it may be. Uh, it's not trying to be secretive. I just I don't want to say but, oh it's twenty five by hundred and and because I'm not looking at the map when the architect already testified okay, to it. I'm then, just trying to create a consistent record. I'm saying that maybe we're just as wrong as you, and then we should supply the answer. Yeah. Our professionals. No. No. Uh -huh. The applicant is asked the question, the applicant answers the question. If they don't know the answer and you happen to know it, you can say. Yeah, but we, I can't, so it's not a matter if, if this goes on another four meetings and we say, well, remember the meeting uh, June 29th? Come on, nobody in the right mind. So mm -hmm. if it's a common sense answer, we you need to give a common sense answer. Can, right, can, common can, sense can, question. Can. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so this means this application will be carried. I believe that there is, uh, we don't have the amount, the uh, enough people to that can attend the special meeting that you requested. So the next time that we have an opening is August 12th, is our next meeting. So I need a motion to. Well, hold on. Great. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Sorry? I'm on I'm going to be in Holland on the 12th. Is there any way the board can accommodate? We, we can go into the September meeting. Hey, you can take me. Yeah, I, <laughs> it, it might be a legality issue with that, Mayor, but thank you. Yeah. Is, is, there, is there any way to accommodate a special meeting then if the... Uh, if in the, August, yes. In August. Well, yes. yeah, if, if, if we have... If you provide some dates in August, just like you provided some for July, mm -hmm. we can fun. certainly do that, but I believe, I believe that we're not allowed to do that at this point because we have to carry and we have to carry with yes. a date. Yes, it has yes. to be carried so with a date that's it, it, certain time and place. And, and I will say it, it, it is unfortunate because we did circulate dates today and August 12th was the date and Mr. Lieberman did not indicate that he was unavailable until we appeared here this evening. So it, it is putting the applicant at a disadvantage that when we're going to but circulate. Everybody's being put at a disadvantage. You're asking for special meetings. Correct, but at the end of. It's not a scheduled meeting, and we usually don't meet more than once in August because we have a very difficult time getting quorums because people take vacations. I, I'm not arguing that. I'm just indicating well, that if, if, if ahead of time we, we did try to address scheduling a meeting, had we known Mr. Lieberman wasn't going to be available on the 12th and he was copied on the emails, we could have before today's meeting put out some dates for August. So it it's one of those things that we are trying to, to make sure everyone's here and seen, but we are also in a position where the people who sat here tonight who have questions may have to wait until September to ask them. And that seems like an awfully long wait. We're okay with that. Jack Lee, could Jack Lee leave? Please. 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 Uh, we legally have to give a date. Mm -hmm. If we're going to carry this, we yeah, legally we have to give a date. We set it later, then you got to renote. Then you're going to have to renote. So, uh, Mr. Sepulchre, could we carry to a July date and then carry again to another new special meeting date? Then everybody's going to have to come here just to hear the date. Certainly, and we don't have to walk. And we don't have and we don't have forms, and, and we don't have our professionals in the July dates, except for July 22nd, 
which is already here, but we just show up and yeah. say to move it. Right. So, so September 9th? September 9th is the next available date um, that the uh, that the uh, board is meeting. September 9th. Oh, hold on. Wait. Mr. Delaney is not available that day. <laughs> and September 23rd is the next day. Is it pot? I, this, we were hoping to avoid this kind of. I I, so the only other option then would be to carry it to a meeting like July 2nd or July. July no, because July our professionals can't be here and we don't have a quorum for July 8th. You mean, you mean just to carry it? That's a question. Could we come back? So the applicant's attorney, or I'm sorry, the objector's attorney has already had an opportunity to, to question Mr. Delaney. Mm -hmm. Could we come back on the 12th so that the public can ask their questions to Mr. Delaney? Um, I don't know. And Mr. Yeah. Lieberman perhaps could send someone in, in just to observe, and it is available on television. August 12th. August 12th. That's our normal, that's our normal meeting. What about the rest of the witnesses? And then we would carry, since Mr. Delaney is the only one that's not available on September 9th, we then would hold off new witnesses until September 9th. I defer to the board. I mean, it seems like not an efficient use of the board's time because I think you'd rather probably have another witness go, right? If they're not well, no. up to the board. I just want to make sure that you know, if you object to it, then. If you're going to, you're not going to have another witness. You're going to finish up. If, if we Delaney, if we right? go on August 12th, we will come to allow Mr. Delaney to be questioned by the public. We will not. I, on my own, we will not. I'm not going to interfere with that. You're right. No. Good. And then if we can then plan to also be here September 9th, at which point we will bring up our next witness after Mr. Delaney. So you want to just continue this testimony of the cross-examination of this witness till the... August 12th. August 12th. And then you're asking for the matter to be carried thereafter from that date to the 9th. That's correct. That's correct. And that's when you'll present the balance of your committee. We'll move on to our next witness at that point. Motion to carry to August 12th without further notice. Second. Just for this one witness? Just for this one witness. For this. I mean, do we have to specify? Yes. Yeah. Just for this. It's on the record. I want to limit it then. Correct. Just for this one witness. <laughs> that's correct. We will. Okay. And then you'd also like us to have a motion to carry your hearing to from that date after this witness is finished <coughs> to September 9th. That, that's without correct. Notes. Okay, without that's further your notes. Motion. Well, for, we, we can vote on this motion. Uh, no, we, we need to vote on the first. I'm sorry. So motion to right. carry please. to August, August please. 12th. Motion to carry to August, yeah, August please, 12th. Please, if you have something to say, please, we need to finish this up. <clears throat> without we, we this to, witness please. solely, without further notice. Right. Second. And we also need any, any consent from you that to extend the time and then we support us and the matter within the other That's correct, yes. That's part of it. Okay, got it. Sorry, Alexis. No. Second. Mike seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And motion to carry to September 9th. No. After this witness is finished that night, the matter will be continued witness. to the 9th without further notice. Motion to carry further testimony September 9th without further notice. Yeah. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.